Good afternoon, my friends. This is the Grim Flare, and I hope you're all doing very well today. And you know what? I'm not just saying that because it's part of my spiel. I genuinely mean it. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you're up to, I hope this finds you well. I hope whatever you're doing is going your way. And, uh, yeah, you know what I'm here for. You know what I'm all about. We're playing some more Golgari Midrange and Modern for you. Full competitive league. Replay format, all the good stuff, and I'll tell you, the, our previous league, there were a relatively, higher, a relatively high amount relative to what we're used to, I suppose, of, of non-games, of games that weren't that close. I'll tell you right out of the gates, my friends, this is the opposite. These are some intense games. I think you're going to like this league. I think you're in for a treat, um, so I hope you'll stay with me for the duration um, real quick, before we get started, I just want to pop over to my Patreon page, and I would like to point out that we are, thanks to the generosity of my, uh, of my supporters, we are within striking distance of the $100 per month goal. We're at $93 per month, and you know what I'm going to do? Um, I am going to officially launch donation leagues for my Patreon supporters, once we hit that $100 per month mark, that's when the donation leagues will begin. Uh, for details on that, you can see the, the video I did kind of floating the idea, and I'll link to that in the description below. But yeah, guys, if we can get over the line to that $100 per month um, threshold, I'll start up the donation leagues. We'll figure out the exact value and take it from there. So thank you to everybody who's currently supporting me on Patreon. Really love you guys. Couldn't do it without you. And for those of you out there who have not subscribed to the channel, if you could do that for me, that would help my channel grow immensely. So thank you for hearing me out on that. And without further ado, let's play some fair magic. Let's play some Golgari. So we've lost the die roll, but we're going to keep this hand. It's fine. It's a little light on gas, but we've got a curve. Um, don't really know what we need, so I don't think this is one we can mulligan. Opponent's going to lead off on a mountain, and they will pass. All right, drawing a land there for turn is not good for us. Um, Blooming Martian Pass is uh, is my play here, although basic mountain, you have to wonder about Blood Moon, so there is maybe an argument to run out of fetch land there, but you also have to wonder about burn. So I split the difference, and I just said we'll play the, the land that is most likely to be good on turn one, which is the Blooming Marsh. Opponent's got another mountain they're tapping out. It's going to be Chalice of the Void on one. Okay, so the uh, the instincts for Blood Moon were not incorrect, but they had Chalice rather than any kind of other prison piece now. Um, because we are suspicious for Blood Moon, we are going to go ahead and fetch a basic forest there. Uh, Dark Confidant was a pretty good draw. That's the clear play here. If he sticks, he's going to be very, very, very good. And uh, he's not really any more or less vulnerable than Tarmogoyf there either. A lot of red spells will still kill the Goyf in that po position. So um, the opponent went ahead and exiled a Simeon Spirit Guide to ramp out a Chandra. And Chandra takes care of Bob. Well, that is pretty good. Um, but they are down to three cards in hand. We've, uh, we're have we still kind of uh, flush over here. So option one here would be to pulse away the Chandra. But... I want to hang on to the Maelstrom Pulse because I'm a little bit worried about Chalice on two, and also because Chandra, you know, uh, it's good to take care of any Planeswalker as soon as possible, right? But the worst she can really do is get them a little card advantage or maybe ping us for two next turn. Uh, the card advantage is not ideal, but, you know, they went down on cards to play her, right, with that Simeon Guide. So I think playing the Tarmogoyf out there is correct. And now Tarmogoyf is insulated from Lightning Bolt, because adding instant to the yard will make it a 3-4. So I really like Tarmogoyf there, although Pulse was reasonable. So they're going to tick Chandra up to add mana. Interesting. And they're going to play a Goblin Rabble Master. All right, I'm not sure I understand why they would play a Rabble Master after Eidolon rather than before. I think they took two for no good reason there, but hey, uh, definitely a strong turn they've got. They've got a lot going on now. This goblin has to attack due to Rabble Master's text, so Goyf gets to eat that, but now what do we do? All right, Assassin's Trophy, huh? Assassin's Trophy is an interesting draw. 
And once again, we're in kind of an interesting position. Um, firing up the treetop village is not the worst here because it can attack over their things. Um, and of course, Tarmogoyf can kind of attack over their things now too. However, we've got a couple pieces of catch-all removal in hand, plus a fatal push, which to be fair is shut off by Chalice of the Void. So I think the thing to do is run out Marsh Flat so we have access to Revolt if we need to, and then attack Vashandra, see what happens. Opponent's going to throw their Eidolon in front of Tarmogoyf. Alright, that is fair. And here, I do finally decide to just pulse away that Chandra. Um, we're going to be in a really good position on board with a 5-6 Tarmogoyf. Treetop Village is reasonable in the matchup. And uh, right now we can't push the Rabble Master due to that Chalice. That would have been a wonderful turn all around if we could have. But um, So the opponent decides to stay back with the Rabbler, just sends in the Goblin. And they're tapping out for Pia and Kirin Nalar. All right, well, they, you know, we kind of hope they were a little bit out of gas, but that's a really nice value piece. So we're going to leave that fetch uncorrect once more for revolt purposes, and we're kind of flooding out. We've got, we've seen seven lands so far, eight if you count this catacombs we cracked. Uh, not great. Not great. So here, I think, once again, the first thing we're going to do is attack with the Tarmogoyf, see what comes of it. The opponent's not assigning a block. All right, so I was a little bit on the fence with how to play this turn, but because they don't assign the block, I think it's time to kind of make our moves, right? So we're going to fetch, we're going to get revolt, and we're going to trophy away the chalice. This will grow the Tarmogoyf by putting both artifact and instant in the yard. So the goyf is a 7-8. Then we're going to push the rabble master. Um, obviously pushing Pia and Kirin is interesting there too, but I think because we did attack... Rabble Master is the one we need to take care of. That card gets out of control. Um, unfortunately, we're kind of out of gas now, but, you know, a 7-8 Tarmogoyf in a treetop village is not that bad of a board state. Um, however, the opponent looks like they have a follow-up because they turn their entire board of weenies sideways. And they <laughs> follow up as a hardcast simian spirit guide. Okay, well, you got it. Um... That's, uh, that's plan B for the good old ape. And we draw Blooming Marsh, so the flood is real. Uh, very, very disappointing here to not have a little bit of gas. Pretty much anything here we could, uh, we could make good use of in our deck, right? Even a discard spell would not be the worst. But, uh, you know, we do have a really scary clock with the Tarmogoyf, so we force the Simeon to chump block. We come across for three. All we can really do is play the Blooming Marsh and pass. We are basically racing. Um, staying back against these Flyers, not a good idea in my opinion, especially with the reach of P and K plus Ramanop Ruins. Remember that they do have a lot of reach on board. So we just kind of have to race them and, and hope to finally draw a little bit of action next turn, I think is our play. They're leaving a Thopter back because uh, now they're, they are facing lethal on board, so they've got to leave back a blocker for the Goyf, but... Looks like they have something else. It's yet another Simeon guide. All right, you know, these. Uh, the first one helped ramp out Chandra ahead of curve, and now they're doing a decent job of, of chump blocking, potentially. Okay, Tireless Tracker. Decent draw. Kind of wanted something a little bit more immediately impactful on the board at this stage. Tracker would have been amazing any of the previous few turns. Uh, we still certainly play her, though. We still certainly play her. Um... Honestly, just leaving her as a blocker along the ground in this situation is not that bad. So, we are going to attack with the Tarmogoyf, and here's why. Them being able to just keep their board wide is actually very bad for us. We need to chew through these things one per turn. And I'm really hoping here that they take the block, because, you know, they could just be dead to a collective brutality, right? Um, so... Maybe they respect the reach, maybe they take the block. Now, what if they don't take the block? Well, we put them to one. That means anything is lethal that we can that we can get across the line with. And we're not that different in terms of blocking. Like, their attacks along the ground are still kind of bad, because we can fire up the treetop village, assign the block with that, block something else with the tracker, and then use the village to crack the clue, so tracker lives, right? So, I think, again... Just like last turn, sitting back entirely is not good. So 
We've got a send in the goif here. And the opponent just takes it, so they are down to one. All right. Um, again, you know, there are there's maybe an incentive to crack a clue there, looking for removal before they get to untap, looking for that collective brutality to just end the game, but I think the safer line is to plan to block with a treetop village and then use it to crack the clue after we've assigned the block. So the opponent will cash in a Thopter with P and K to get us for two. Opponent's attacking with only the Thopter. All right, so now that we know we don't need to assign blocks, we're pretty safe to just crack a clue. Now we might as well in case there's something we want to do here in the combat step. There's not, it's just a Lily of the Veil. Okay. Another card that would have been great just a little bit earlier. But the Thopter gets us for one, then they rip an Eidolon of the Great Ravel. Ooh, so that's actually really tricky. It's a really, really tricky one. Because remember, once again, they have the reach. They can hit us for two with the P and K, sacking a Thopter. Um, or, once they untap, they can do the same thing with Ramanop Ruins. We can't really go below five without being at risk of that. And even if we, uh, even if they only have the mana to do one of those things, we are dead to either one plus the Thopter attack, right? So, definitely puts us in a little bit of an awkward situation with regard to our draw here. All right, we untap, we draw Tarmogoyf. Okay, okay, so here I had to really sit down and do the math. So if we stay back and we just block, they can, you know, they might be suspicious for removal, but we can't really cast it into that Eidolon necessarily uh, without just kind of, uh, it kind of, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? It kind of negating itself, right? Because, you know, we save two damage by killing an attacker, we take two from the Eidolon, right? So, um, while we could kind of sit back and bluff a canny opponent who's done the math, the bluff's not going to work, they're going to turn everything sideways and activate Ramanop Ruins, and we're going to be dead. So, what happens if we send everything in? Well, they have to block everything, and here is actually where the trample of Treetop Village is super relevant. Because we would, if this thing didn't trample, we'd be fairly dead, I think. Because they could just block three things, stay alive, untap, hit us with, uh, with a 2-2 two -two and a 1-1. One -one, or even two 2-2s two if they... Uh, no, they would have to block with a 2-2, two -two, right? So they'd untap with a 2-2 two -two and a 1-1 one -one left. They'd hit us for three, and then they'd kill us with Ramanop Ruins. Um... <clears throat> And again, playing Liliana and Tarmogoyf doesn't really change that because they would block with everything except Eidolon that's untapped. However, the fact that Treetop Village tramples means they actually have to double block the Treetop Village somehow. This means that all four of their creatures have got to get involved, and then we might be able to make some follow-up plays if we can get the Eidolon off the field. So I think the first thing to do is to uh, make that land drop and just try to crack a clue, because we still have the mana to make a follow-up play of Tarmogoyf if the clue doesn't yield anything. Again, we could just draw Collective Brutality here and win. It's a swamp. All right. The flood continues. So here we go. Fire up the treetop village. Send in the horde. And let's see how the opponent decides to block here. This is a really tricky few turns here with all of these uh, attacks and blocks, all these decisions. So, as, as expected, the opponent does two chump blocks, and they are going to double block the treetop village. So we go ahead and swap the order to make sure we kill Eidolon of the Great Ravel there. And that's how we do it. That's, that's our best possible situation here. It's the best we could muster in the face of that Eidolon off the top. So now, we play our Tarmogoyf. This means we are not dead on board. One, two, three, four, five, six lands, they can attack us for one with the Thopter, and then they can pay five mana to sacrifice the Ramanop Ruins and get us for another two. So we're dead to a lot of things. We're dead to a Lightning Bolt. We're dead to, I'm sure, plenty, plenty of other things. But as far as I can tell, this is kind of the best we could manage. So the opponent is just going to actually cash in that Thopter now, which is more mana efficient. And now they're going to untap, they're going to scoop. So whatever they drew for turn 
it was not sufficient to kill us. Even if, I'm, I'm sure they don't play gut shot in a prison deck, but we were even no <laughs> dead to a gut shot, right? It's just, uh, oh, this game was just on the knife's edge. But when you're in a situation like this, you've just got to really slow down and do the math. Double check your math on the combat, uh, you know, at, at every turn, basically. Got to double check your math and make sure you're giving yourself the best possible odds. Uh, we were dead to plenty of top decks throughout that uh, those last few crucial turns, but to be fair, so were they. So were they. They were dead to collective brutality. They also could easily have just gotten buried if we didn't flood during the mid-game. But as it was, the sheer power of Tarmogoyf, um, and the fact that we were able to uh, sneak in that early attack, you know, they declined to block, we trophied, we pushed... We got seven points of damage across uncontested. That was huge. That forced them into chump block mode basically from there on out. Every time we attacked with a goyf, they had to throw something in front of it. Treetop Village closing right alongside it, and it was wonderful. So, um, super interesting game against Mono Red Prison. I don't... I don't... I'm not a fan of the Mono Red Prison decks. I really hate the non-games generated by early Blood Moons, early Chalices of the Void. But, you know, if it is a game... If it, if it is an actual game, the games are often pretty interesting, which was the case here. So, um, having won game one, let's check out the sideboard. Alright, my friends, so what to do against Mono Red Prison? Well, in my opinion, not all that much. I think we want to be conservative in our sideboarding. No surprise to anybody that Maelstrom Pulse comes in here. It's probably our, our most nailed-on strong card out of the side. I also like Engineered Explosives, you know. They may or may not leave Chalices in, but if they do, this can hit Chalices. They showed me a lot of tokens this can hit. Um, and it is something that is castable under Blood Moon in some way, shape, or form. Potentially even going up to three. Uh, it's going to be a card with high variance, but I think it's good enough to bring in. Um, beyond that, I really don't know what we want. Uh, Nissa and Kitchen Finks are both cards that kind of play well in the matchup in every way, except the double green is awkward for them. Again, with respect to Blood Moon, that can be very awkward. I don't really think anything else is super appealing, so we can consider these two. We can also put Liliana the Last Hope in a similar category. I think one Liliana is probably where you want to be. I don't necessarily know that you want the second. Um... I would love more feedback on this matchup, by the way, how to sideboard. I would love to hear your thoughts. But uh, I think we've got two certainties and then maybe three further considerations. So what are we doing here? I don't necessarily think that triple scoos is the way to go. Again, another thing that can be awkward under Moon. I think we can safely shave one of those and not lose out on too, too much. From there, you know, um, I think we can cut away one Fatal Push. It is a card we want to leave in some copies of for that Rabble Master, for that P and K. But, again, with respect to Moon, that can kind of shut off Revolt, or may at least make Revolt harder to come by. And there are progressions where they're just playing their non-creature permanents, and your Fatal Pushes are a little bit bad. So I think having too many pushes in hand is definitely not where you want to be. Um, we could consider shaving a Collective Brutality, but, you know, this does kind of cleanly kill Rabble Master and P and K that we saw there. The Drain is, I guess, never dead. Um, you know, the discard mode I don't expect to be great, right? But here's the thing, you know, if we're looking at two cards, like maybe comparing Collective Brutality to Liliana the Last Hope, I think I would rather have one of each than two of one or two of the other. So, um, at the end of the day, I just kind of decided to leave my main deck mostly as it was. We didn't get too frisky with Finks and Nissa. Maybe we could revisit that on the play, especially the Nissa is a little more attractive on the play. But, honestly, most of, uh, of what our main deck is up to is very good. We love Discard in this matchup. We love Liliana of the Veil. Vale. Tarmogoyf is amazing. 
all of this non-creature uh, spot removal is amazing. Dark Confidant dies to, to stiff, stiff Breeze, excuse me. But if he sticks, he is so good in the matchup, too. We've got Kalidus, who outsizes a lot of Red Bolts, you know, Bolt-style effects. I think he's fine to leave in. He might be one of the weaker ones, but I think he's fine. So, yeah, at the end of the day, I sideboarded very conservatively here. But um, as always, my friends, let me know what you would do. Regardless, this is what my 60 looked like, and we will go to Game 2. All right, my friends, here we are for Game 2 against Mono Red Prison, and our hand is extremely vulnerable to Blood Moon. However, we have the protection of Turn 1 Thoughtseize into uh, that can either take away the Blood Moon or clear the way for our Turn turn 2 Dark Confidant. These double overgrown tombs plus the Thoughtseize and the Confidant, it's all very painful. But our opponent has mulliganed to 6, and I am inclined to keep it. Despite the downsides, the hand is extremely powerful. Tarmogoyf is another very, very strong one. So we if this was just a forest and a swamp, this hand would be amazing, right? But uh, despite the uh, less than ideal nature of our hand, and look at that, we draw a swamp for the first turn. So basically we wanted to fade a turn one chalice there, and we successfully faded the turn one chalice. So... Go ahead and open with Swamp into Thought Seize, and we see uh, the opponent does indeed have a Blood Moon. We might just have to take the Blood Moon, but what happens if we don't? Well, if we don't, they could rip a Mana Accelerant, and then we are locked out of green. So if they, if we don't take the Blood Moon and they do rip the Mana Accelerant, we are all in on the Stark Confidant. Might, might still work out for us, but... Um, what else do we do we have as options? So there's the Sorcerer Spyglass. I don't really care about that. If it trades with my Liliana the Last Hope, basically, and then eventually we can maybe destroy it, I think that's a totally fine place for me to be. Don't care that much about this card. So Chandra is a very, very powerful top end here, but I think we can beat her with what's in our hand with the Tarmogoyf and the Bob. So as things stand, I wanted to take the Blood Moon. This way, pretty much no matter what happens, I expect to untap with a Dark Confidant. Again, you know, short of short of their top decks, right? And uh, then even if they roast the Confidant with Chandra, maybe we'll have played a Tarmogoyf by then. Uh, Assassin's Trophy, that's a good draw. That is a good, good draw because it's just going to be a nice safety valve for us against just about anything, uh, pretty much besides a Chalice on two. So we're hoping to fade... Um, a Mana Accelerant into Chandra here. And it looks like we will. They just go Gemstone Caverns Pass. So beautiful. We're untapping with the Bob. And Bob shows us a Tireless Tracker. So we already had a painful progression. Uh, getting a lot more painful out of the gates, right? So, um, and plus Tracker is not particularly appealing here. So let's see if our Bob lives, which of course he will. If they had a kill spell, they would have used it on their turn. But... Still good practice just to get in for two before we do anything else. In here, I, I think it's just correct to play the Tarmogoyf and uh, play that Tomb Tap to uh, respect our life total. Uh, Tarmogoyf is immune to Lightning Bolt right now. It's We are soft to Anger of the Gods. That's the one thing we're very weak to Anger right now. But if they don't have the Anger, they just play... Uh, and to be fair, they might not even have Anger in their 75 with uh, Rabble Master and, and Pia and Kirin floating around, right? So... They just go Mountain into Chandra. That is why I wanted to play the Goyf, because no matter who they kill with the Chandra, we can kill we can kill her on the crackback, right? So she's going to roast the Goyf. I think that's probably the correct choice. And here we go. Now Bob is showing us the good stuff. He shows us a basic forest. That's just beautiful. So um, Liliana the Last Hope ticking down is actually quite a reasonable play here, because I, I forgot to point this out. They actually named Liliana of the Veil with a spyglass, even though they saw Last Hope in our hand. So I assume that wasn't just a mistake. I assume they didn't either misclick or, or misread our hand. And, you know, to be fair, that is a reasonable thing to do. Lily of the Veil is very, very, very good against these prison decks, especially when they don't have the uh, Rabble Masters and Pia and Kirins out to pressure her off the field. So, um, anyway, like I was saying, last hope ticking down. It is a reasonable play, but we are very ahead on resources. We don't need to do that. I would rather develop the board. 
Um, so Confidant will take care of Chandra. Tracker will come down and make a clue. It's all very proactive. It's all very good. Opponent makes another land drop, and they tap out for a Simeon Spirit Guide. Well, only one card left in hand, so it's looking very good for us. They, pro they must certainly have just another Simeon or another Mana Source in hand, I have to assume. We will untap, and Dark Confidant flips a Goyf. Sure. Uh, we'll play another basic land. We will crack a clue, grow the tracker, all that good stuff. And we find another land. So while attacking into the guide is totally fine, maybe trading away the bob, I'm also fine just using the fatal push here. We have trophy and potentially Lily the Last Hope as answers to other things. And more importantly, we just have a massive board now. We're getting in for six. Uh, we play a 5-6 Tarmogoyf. I'm happy to just end this game before they can find anything too crazy. They're going to untap, they're going to take their draw step, and they're going to scoop it up. So, very, very intense game one. Um, it only went nine turns, which is not the longest game, I, I think, in a recent league against Shadow. I was on turn 24 or something by the time the game ended. So, you've seen longer games before, but that game one here against this mono red prison deck man were those combat steps intense they were really really tight and uh, of course the game was was about as close as you can possibly get here in game two you know we kind of ran them over a little bit more we just had a really nice curve out thought sees takes away their blood moon dark confidant on turn two lives to untap then we play the goif alongside him and you know they've got the chandra really nice value play but they can only answer one thing they answered the Goyf, and then we're off to the races with some more goods. Finds off of Bob, and a Tracker, and a Goyf. It was a beautiful, beautiful curve out here, and we took care of them uh, with an overwhelming display of, of card advantage and of onboard presence. So, feels great to uh, to put the Mono Red Prison deck back in their place. Uh, we, we don't like to see the non-games here, and we, uh, we force them to, to get on our level and interact. So, good game, well played to the opponent. And uh, we advance to 1-0 in the league. I will see you for round two. All right, everybody. We lost the die roll again. What do we think of our hand? Well, there's a, there's a few obvious issues with it. Number one, it's a little bit slow. Uh, number two, we do not have double black for Liliana. However, you know, our curve is fine. We can go Quagmire into either Brutality or Scooze, as the case may, may dictate. And then from there, you know, we've, we will have had three chances to hit our third black land. I think this hand is fine. It's, uh, it's just a little clunky. Oh, the opponent's going to mull to six. All right, that makes our decision to keep even easier, you know. We don't know what we need in game one. We can uh, rest a little bit easier that we're not necessarily going to get run over. And the opponent's going to open on a brush land. So these pain lands, usually a sign of Eldrazi. Usually a sign of Eldrazi because adding that colorless is integral to these uh most of these eldrazi decks when they're playing these pain lands are actually three color for all intents and purposes so brush land in the noble hierarch well i am very very disappointed that i cannot push that hierarch because that seems like a thing i really want to do but at least we drew our swamp so we're not going to have issues uh lacking double black for what that's worth Opponent's going to go get a breeding pool, so we are against Bant. And they play Eldrazi Sky Spawner, so this looks like, you know, a, a classic deck that's not as common in the meta as it used to be. And that's uh, that's an understatement. It actually used to be up there in near Tier 1 or thereabouts, and now it's kind of fallen off hard. But it's still around, and it is Bant Eldrazi. Eldrazi Sky Spawner, nice little value piece. Uh, evasive attacker that makes a makes a one-shot monodork slash expendable body. So here we are in an interesting position. We don't have anything that's particularly compelling to do. We're, we're basically at the point where we either play a creature just to kind of develop our board and then try to start interacting next turn, or we collective brutality away something. And even that, you know, we could hit the sky spawner um, to get rid of this evasive clock and something that can potentially be blinked for value the Bant Eldrazi deck plays Eldrazi Displacer very very good in uh, target target for that blink effect or we could hit Noble Hierarch because that contributes to the clock too 
and it's also uh, helping to ramp them. But now that they've, there's no real reason to believe they don't have a third land. They've got another piece of ramp on field. So I did consider it, but at the end of the day I said, ah, uh, I don't think hitting Hierarch is correct. I'll just kill this guy spawner. Um, but again, you know, like playing Tarmogoyf there would have been reasonable in my opinion. It wasn't clear what the best, uh, what the best bet was. We're getting hit by this uh, exalted Eldrazi Scion. You got us. Down to 18. Opponent's going to play an Eternal Witness. Now that's very annoying. They've got this uh, nice grindy value piece very well positioned against us in the main deck. And they buy back a Windswept Heath. Alright. So, Windswept Heath is the play. And they'll pass. We draw Inquisition and I think we more or less have to do it now. If we're going to do it at all. If it was Thoughtseize, maybe we could uh, sandbag it for one more turn, but I think we have to Inquisition right now, so that's what we'll do. And we see a very interesting and very powerful, frankly, hand. First of all, they have a Reality Smasher. We can't take that. They've got five mana on board. All right, so if they want, they can smash us next turn. They can cash in that Scion to do so. Nothing we can really do about that. They have Engineered Explosives, which is annoying because they can set it to two or three, doesn't hurt them that badly on three right now, although it will if they run out this Displacer first. And it doesn't hurt them at all on two, and of course all of our permanents, all of our creatures are concentrated on two. Liliana of the Veil vale is now kind of a low-value card against this very wide board with a lot of expendable things, right? So for that reason, I did say I think we need to lean on our two drops. I think we need to take the EE. But Eldrazi Displacer is a very powerful card against us. Very good at kind of uh, blanking spot removal or just generating repeated value. So, again, tough call. Not a clear decision, in my opinion. But for us to just kind of leave the EE in their hand, I don't think, I don't think we can really afford to do that. Right now, we're not really mustering much without the uh, power of our two drops, right? So... Opponent's going to actually go for the Displacer before they go for the Smasher. Super interesting. And they've got a path to exile. So, okay, that makes sense. That's a nice uh, double spell turn. Takes care of our Tarmogoyf. And they still get to clock us here with an Exalted Eternal Witness. Taken three. Assassin's Trophy. Assassin's Trophy. Well, I went ahead and played the Scavenging Ooze here. And I decided to pass. So here was, my, here was my thinking. We had a few different options. Number one, we could play the Liliana the Last Hope. Excuse me, the Liliana of the Veil. And we could tick her up. We could tick her up. Then we would be getting the Reality Smasher out of their hand. Now, that's definitely one way to do it. But if we wanted to do that and hold up Trophy we are ditching our other scoos to do so. And at the end of the day, I did not think it was good to have a symmetrical effect here, if at all possible. And I'm thinking, you know what? If they tap out for the Smasher, well, then I get to trophy it away anyway. I have to, I have to pitch a card either way. So I think I would rather do that in case they've got something else. I don't know. I don't know. It was, it was definitely a tough call. But the reason I sandbagged my Field of Ruin is to have something to pitch here. Ultimately, I want to maneuver myself into a position where I can hold up Hissing Quagmire as a blocker as well. So they just drew a brush land for turn. At least we faded that draw step. Now here, they're going to attack with the Eldrazi Displacer. So now I'm like, all right. I probably would not have done this if they had sandbagged that land in hand. I probably just would have taken it. But I decided to try to force a little bit of action, because now next turn, I think, okay, now I might actually play the Liliana um, and, and tick her up next turn, because I just, you know, I, I spent this turn doing the scoos, next turn I can afford to do that. But this was still a little bit loose of me, because of course now they get to blink in response. I didn't quite put together, to be honest, I, I just kind of didn't put together how strong this would be for them. They get to blink the Eternal Witness. Very, very good. Buyback Engineered Explosives. And then they sack the Eldrazi Scion. And... Or did they? Maybe they, they undid that. And they, you know, they sacked it, and then they just blink her again to buy back, back Path to Exile. Then they allow the trophy to resolve, 
and they get to land on top of all that. So that was pretty loose for me. I probably should have, if I was going to trophy, just trophied that thing while they were tapped out. Um, again, my plan here was to be a little bit more cagey. When I saw they had a land for turn, I said, well, they've got no gas in hand, I'm just going to force some action. That was a mistake, that was a mistake, so I didn't respect the power of Eldrazi Displacer. And now I cannot even cleanly get the Smasher out of their hand, because of course they just refilled their hand. So, not much to really do here, we don't want to play the second Scooze out into uh, Engineered Explosives necessarily. At least we'll attack first and see if they want to spend a Path to Exile. They don't. Okay. So here I'm just going to pass. We're holding up Scooze. We're holding up uh, Quagmire. Um, the other the other reason that was loose is that, um, you know, with, with them trying to blink Eternal Witness, Scooze is actually a good way to play around that, right? We can compete over the graveyard stuff. So anyway, um, we'll see if we can come back from that. And they are going to uh, throw down the Reality Smasher, and they're going to attack with both. So this is their way to make sure damage gets across if I do indeed fire up the Quagmire and take the block. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Sure enough, they're going to path the Hissing Quagmire. All right, well, we'll uh, eat the Displacer, use that mana effectively. One less thing they can buy back with future witnesses, gain a life, grow our ooze, all that good stuff. All right, so they drew another land for turn, so we're a bit lucky that they, they hit yet another land drop there. And now we know that that Engineered Explosives in, is in their hand. We draw Liliana the Last Hope, or excuse me, I keep misspeaking, keep confusing the two. We draw another Liliana of the Veil. And I think that is my cue to tick up, pitch my Field of Ruin, and which I've been sandbagging this whole time for a kind of free pitch to Liliana, and get that EE out of their hand. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and say, all right, throwing down both of my scoozes. The reason I did that here is because from here on out, I want to be able to hold up Hissing Quagmire for basically the entire rest of the game, right? The entirety of this game, from here on out, if possible, I'm going to hold up the Quagmire. Therefore, I'm just going to use my mana all on this turn, you know, the, the double lose is not holding up any activations is a little bit rough, but hey, I, I think that was the correct play here. And Smasher is coming across at Liliana. Here was my other hope, that they would feel obligated to take care of the Lily rather than pressure me, and I am so fine with that. I'm just going to let it through. She's done her job. She basically gained us, uh, gained us some life, took care of the EE. I'm totally fine with it. They play Thalia. Okay. Not the scariest card, but actually one that could could become relevant. In here, it is actually rather relevant, because I can either hold up the Quagmire, or I can play Liliana. I can't really do both. So, I think we just play out the Blooming Marsh, because it's uh, obviously a land to develop around the tax and, and around our Mana Sinks for future purposes. So here we're uh, hoping to fade a draw step, and... You know, we, we did fade a couple draw steps, but they ripped a really nice one here. Thought not Seer. Very, very punished for kind of uh, sandbagging our Liliana there, but I think we had to. I think we had to, because now they can't really attack into us. They they don't have a good attack. So, um, on the end step here, we're just going to clean up the graveyard. And, uh, because we've seen... Uh, We've seen Graveyard Recursion from Eternal Witness. There's no reason not to just kind of fully clean out the yard there, right? So, Dark Confidant's our draw. All right, well, I'm going to play him. Going to play him, and we're just once more kind of passing, holding up Scoozes. And Quagmires. Okay. So, Thalia attacks here, and, and here's something that I didn't really see. So, I split the difference between my oozes here. It's just better against spot removal, um, but it is not better against an Exalted Thalia attacking, so uh, they can attack for free here, and I chose not to chump block, because that's what all it would be is a chump block. Um, definitely would have been better off there putting another counter on my 3-3 three, three scoos to make it a 4-4, four, four, but hey, you know. Um, we'll untap and we'll hope for some good stuff off of Bob. Blooming Marsh off of Bob, it's not exactly good, it's at least painless. But you know what? These Blooming Marshes are kinda killing us. They're kinda killing us. Entering the battlefield tapped is a little bit annoying with Athalia on board, but... 
I think now we do finally have to play a Liliana. Anything going to the graveyard at this point is fine with me. It's just a way to buff a Skuze, if nothing else, and make the board slightly smaller. But here we have to go shields down with respect to, uh, to our Hissing Quagmire. So let's see what the opponent does if they can try to take advantage of this. Okay, they're going to attack with the Reality Smasher. They've got the Exalted Trigger, sure. So let's make sure our, our ooze is successfully grown. It is. And here, you know, we don't really have any choice but to double block. They have two cards in hand. We could get blown out by a Path to Exile, but I don't think we have another choice. They're rearranging the blockers, and damage is assigned. So, okay, we were able to trade off with a Reality Smasher. Seems fine to me, but they've got another Thalia. Sure. That's pretty good value for them, uh because they sacked her, of course, to the first Liliana. So we'll eat the Smasher on the end step. Bob flips a tireless tracker. Well, I have very mixed feelings about that, because taking three here is awful. But tracker with a fetch land, I have seen worse two-card combinations uh, for, my, for my cards for turn. That is for sure, my friends. So we're going to make one clue. Uh, before we fill our hand back up, we'll get the Lily ticked up back to two. And I don't really want to fetch unless I, I think I have to. But at this point, I did the math, and I'm like, all right, what, what could I realistically draw? And they could get Path to Exile off the top, blah, blah, blah. I think we just say we're going we're gonna to take one. We're going to go down to five. And here, as good as, uh, as some of our cracks off of the clue could be, again, I want to hold up Hissing Quagmire. Here we can activate Quagmire, assign the block, and then crack a clue. That's a pretty good use of mana. So I think we're in a super defensive posture here. And they rip a Reality Smasher off the top. Well, that is terrifying. That is terrifying. Again, we, we did fade some draw steps, but they've also had some really good draw steps as well. Uh, super interesting game. Like I said, guys, lots of, uh, lots of really, uh, really cool things going on in this league. So... Um, I don't think with how low our life total is and with Trample there, I don't think now is the time to go for the Quagmire block. I think we need to once more just assign a double block with our creatures, not let any Trample through, save the Quagmire to trade off one for one with like a Thought Not Seer if that's their next attacker, right? So we'll crack a clue. It's going to grow the tracker, maybe give us some uh, something good to do here, but doesn't look like it. So it's just time for the double block, and we'll let the opponent decide who they want to kill, I guess. But we'll grow as big as possible beforehand, just no real reason not to. Cracking our clues, gaining life, and the opponent's going to take care of Sku. So we get to keep Tracker around. Makes sense, they don't want us to gain any more life. And uh, we've drawn Fatal Push and a land off of, uh, off of those two clues. So Bob here with the upkeep trigger showing us an overgrown tomb. All right, Bob. Very nice. So once again, being very respectful of my life total, I just decided to play the tomb instead of the fetch land. Thought Seize was the draw for turn. Let's crack a clue here and Assassin's Trophy. Sure. So we've got plenty to do here. And uh, the first order of business, I think, is to fatal push that Thought Not Seer, draw another card, get even more information and potentially more action here. It's just a land, but that's still fine. We're just going to keep on clearing out this board. So very happy to cash in my Liliana here. Her ticking up would be asymmetrical against us. So we'll cash her in, trade her for the Noble Hierarch. And now we're going to send in the tracker. They don't have any good blocks here. Um, we'll see what they do. They're going to take it. All right. So I'm pretty happy to come across for six there. And just to pass, because once more, we're holding up Hessing Quagmire. We're holding up Trophy as well, plus bluffing other things. And we, of course, have Dark Confidant as a blocker. So, hoping to fade a draw step here. They've got a Thought Knot here. All right, that's, you know, it's not a Reality Smasher, so I'm, I'm pretty okay with it. It's still a good one, though. Still a good piece of gas off the top. We will trophy this in response. No real reason not to. It does let them potentially take what we find off of it, which is a Tarmogoyf. I expect that to go, and it does. So Tarmogoyf is exiled, but we did successfully trade off with a Thought Knot. 
and the opponent can't really do much here. They kind of have to stay back, so Bob is going to flip another Bob. Well, that is not very good. However, we're going to go digging, and now it is time to put the fetch land down because we can end the game this turn if we find enough gas. So making having the potential to make a second clue is well worth it, and we draw Fatal Push. That is beautiful. So now it looks like we've got it pretty much in the bag, but let's keep digging. And it's a Liliana of the Veil. Well, that is just perfect. It allows us to end the game in style. So Fatal Push for the Thalia, Edict with our Liliana, and then the opponent scoops it up because we're just going to turn our two card advantage engines sideways and hit them for 10. Quite the game, my friends, quite the game. I do admit to uh, playing loosely on the turn involving my attempted, I guess, successful Assassin's Trophy on the Eldrazi Displacer. I probably should have just trophied that thing away before it even came down, or I should have been disciplined and held my trophy a little while longer. Doing so, you know what, kind of forced some action. There is some benefits to that. If we're just playing Drago with the uh, Displacer, they're going to get value. They're going to kind of grind us out sooner or later. So I guess the, the clear play was to just trophy that thing away. I was a little bit leery of, of, of course, that Reality Smasher that we knew was in their hand. Our progression was just a little bit too clunky. I don't think we ever had the ideal double spell turns and those mid-game turns. I don't think we had the opportunity for those. However, um, still no excuse for me not to not to see just how much value they could get in the spot that they did. However, we were able to recover, we were able to stabilize, and we were able to uh, execute some relatively tight play from there on out to kind of uh, to kind of come through in the end. It was a super intense game. Lots of good top deck rips on both sides. Lots of uh, crazy stuff going on. Very, very interactive. And in the end, we got there. Great, uh, great job to all of these uh, card advantage engines. Dark Confidant was great. Tireless Tracker was great. Scavenging Ooze, very, very good too. So, um, yeah, we, we take game one. Let's go to the sideboard. All right, my friends. So how do we sideboard against Bant Eldrazi? Well, I'm not, I'm going to be frank with you. I am not 100% sure about this. I have not faced Bant Eldrazi in minimum a year. Literally haven't seen it anywhere in a year. Not in paper, not in the tournament practice lobby, not in a league. So uh, some of you may be, may be better equipped to say that than myself. However, I do know we want Maelstrom Pulse. Big surprise, this card comes in so much. Always good against Eldrazi variants of any kind, and I do know we want Damnation. Damnation is great. From there, I think it gets a little bit murkier, so I'll tell you things that I think are reasonable to consider. So, first of all, Fulminator Mage, it is reasonable. Anything that's ramping up to, like, these Eldrazi decks to the four, five, six drops, Fulminator is reasonable. Um, this is kind of a mid-range-esque uh, situation, almost a mid-range mirror in some ways, so Nissa Vital Force, Kitchen thinks these cards are fine. They're they're not the very best, but they're definitely fine. You could even consider Engineered Explosives because it's a way to slow them down by killing a Noble Hierarch or two. Uh, they do produce some tokens. I don't know, uh, I don't know how highly I rate it, perhaps not that highly, but it is there. Uh, as a maybe board card. And once again, with uh, cards like Collective Brutality and Liliana the Last Hope, kind of like how we felt against Prison, I think the 1-1 one -one split that we have in the main is fine. Like, these cards can kill the X-1s, they can kill Hierarch, they can kill Sky Spawner, um, but there's also a lot of things they can't kill, right? So Brutality has the other modes, Liliana has her minus two. I think leveraging exactly one of both of those cards is fine, but I'm not really interested in the second copy. So two cards for sure, and then maybe six or so maybe board cards. Um, what don't we like? Well, I'll show you what I did and then I'll show you what I would do with the benefit of hindsight. So I think what I did here is just simply said, all right, cutting one scavenging ooze is fine. They're exiling things. They're not necessarily putting much into our graveyard. Ooze is just a little bit weak, a little bit clunky. So taking away one ooze there I think is good. And 
then from there, I think I just made, um, I think I cut a Blooming Marsh, considering that this match is going to get grindy. It is kind of a mid-range mirror. They might be ramping me with Path anyway. So cutting an Ooze and a Marsh, I think, is totally fine. What I And I brought in my Fulminator Mages here. I don't necessarily know that I would do that, and I, I think it's reasonable. I think Fink's Nissa especially might be more reasonable than those. Uh, I don't know how to rate Engineered Explosives, but I can tell you one thing. I left in my Inquisitions here, at least for Game 2, I might have gone back to the drawing board for Game 3. Can't remember. But I left in my Inquisitions, and I actually don't really like doing that. I think you can cut all but one here on the draw, and if there's a Game 3 for the play, maybe you just cut all three. It's just, again, kind of a mid-range mirror, at least that's how I see it, and Inquisition can whiff on a lot of stuff. So, I would advise cutting inquisitions i believe for the game you're about to see at least for game two i left them in but um you know so so keep that in mind but as far as how i would advise siding again with my limited experience against this deck it would probably be something like this maybe on the draw we just play all three fulminators and maybe on the on the play if there's a game three we bring in the nissa and we cut something else maybe uh yeah maybe a fulminator can just make way, or maybe there's something that's a little bit worse. I don't know, but regardless, I, I believe for the game you're about to see we sideboarded like this, and uh, yeah, like, oh, oh, sorry, for the game we're about to see we didn't sideboard like this because the Inquisitions were in, right? But regardless, I do think the Inquisitions should come out, so you'll have to let me know what you think about this, but regardless, we've got Game 2 against Bantel Drazi. Let's check it out. Okay, so on the draw here, our hand is very, very good in a lot of ways. It's super lean and low to the ground and efficient and painless, and we can cast everything. The problem is, they are an Eldrazi deck. They have a very significant top end, and a lot of stuff like Inquisition and Fatal Push can whiff on, on some of their big payoff cards, but I do think it's still a keep. It's a very functional hand. Our opponent likes 7 as well, so sure. They fetch a Temple Guard and untapped. Ancient Stirrings is going to find them a Plains. All right, fair enough. We draw Kalidus. Well, that's not great. We've got uh, a long way to go, but, you know, he could be useful eh? a little bit down the road. But for now, we'll lead on our Inquisition. And yeah, this is what we were afraid of with this hand. They've just got a big top end that right now we can't do anything about any of these cards. We need to find more lands. Uh, we need to Revolt for Fatal Push. And even so, you know, we, we still are, are staring down some good stuff, some, some pretty scary stuff. But, of course, we take away our only legal take, which is the Displacer. At least our Inquisition didn't whiff. And we'll pass. They play out the coast, pass back. Uh, tireless Tracker, not a very good draw. Again, we need lands, and we need things that can answer their top end, whether it be giving us a revolt or just finding, the you know, more universal kill spells, I guess. They found a 3-drop, and it is another Displacer. Well, this is going from bad to worse, because now they have a really good value piece on board, and we draw an Inquisition for a turn, which is just awful, because unless the last card in their hand is something that they can, uh, that that's CMC 3 or below, the Inquisition's gonna with, and more importantly, we failed to hit our third land drop. So, yeah, I don't think we're supposed to trophy that Displacer as good as it is. In as much as we kind of wish we trophied the Displacer while they were tapped out last game, do we really want to ramp them into this other stuff? I don't think so. So we expect them to tap out here for a Thought Knot Seer, which they do. Now here's our window to, to do something to use our mana. We're going to trophy the Thought Knot. Again, we're ramping them, you know, kind of unavoidable at this point. What's good about this is we get to see another card. We get to dig for a land. And there it is. There's our land. They cannot take away a land with a Thought Knot Seer. So they take away our Tireless Tracker, sure. I mean, our hand's not that great. That's, I guess, the upside of getting something exiled by Thought Knot, right? So they come across for three. And they've got an Ancient Stirrings. Well, we are severely punished for having to trophy that thing. What a good turn for them. They Stirrings into a Thought Knot. Very, very bad. And we just draw a Tarmogoyf, which is, uh, frankly... Probably better than anything else we had, but boy, oh boy, did we want to hit 
like an abrupt decay or a fetch land or something there to take care of that displacer. We need to keep the board clear, in my opinion, if we can. But now we're just kind of saying, all right, Tarmogoyf, protect us. And, uh, you know, kind of expected a thought not or a smasher there, but they go for the Sky Spawner. Interesting. Interesting. Looks like they're setting up for a big turn next turn. But for now, they just have to pass. Um, Fulminator Mage is our draw. Okay. Again, again, we kind of uh, wish we could kill this Displacer maybe before... Well, even, even now our window has kind of gone, right? Because they've got the Scion they can sack in response. So I guess removal here wouldn't be that great. And knowing how, uh, you know, based on how they sequenced last turn, you know, choosing to play out the Sky Spawner instead of maybe some uh, something more directly impactful, I think they do want to develop their mana. So I chose to just straight up hit them with the Fulminator. I don't know if Cavern was the correct land to hit there. I guess I'm thinking maybe in some world they're splashing, you know, for some uh, non-bant colored Eldrazi, but they've got a redundancy with all their color production, right? So I don't think it necessarily mattered what I hit there. Regardless, they have another land anyway. Uh, interesting line there might have been to just play the Fulminator and pass, and then when we untap, we could consider activating Fulminator to get Revolt for Fatal Push. Um, so that is definitely... An interesting thought, but yep, they, they just play a Thought Knot Seer. They're still sandbagging that Reality Smasher for a while, um, but Thought Knot takes away Kalidus, and they've got the clock going in the air, so Tarmogoyf is at least kind of holding them off. And we draw Liliana of the Veil. Well, that is actually a pretty good draw. We get to play her, we get to tick her up. That's definitely the play is to tick her up, pitch this bad Inquisition, and get some kind of gas out of their hand, either Thought Knot or Smasher. <clears throat> and it's a Smasher, so... Okay, I mean, the holding pattern is kind of legit, you know? It's it's kind of looking legit. They are tapping out here, sacking the Eldrazi Scion, and... Okay, well, that's inconvenient. The, uh, the replay function is kind of... Kind of letting us down here, my friends. Sorry about this. Do we have the game log? Oh, look at that bug. Okay. This says they path to exile. I don't think they did. I think this replay is just bugging out. What they did here is they played a Drowner of Hope. So the Drowner of Hope is just taking over the game here, making more tokens. It's forcing us to tap. And from here, we are just pretty dead. Uh, I think the replay is going to kind of crap out on us from here. I do apologize, my friends. This is the hazard of, of using the replay, but we'll we'll click through a couple times. Obviously, I didn't pass without doing anything with my Liliana. Um, yeah, I, I think the uh, the replay function has come to the end of its usefulness here for this game. So, basically, they, they tapped out for the Drowner of Hope. Drowner of Hope is able to sacrifice the tokens that it makes to tap down creatures, and they were able to pressure my Liliana off the board. They had another Thought Not Seer in hand, and they ripped another Reality Smasher off the top, as I recall. All while we're sitting here looking dumb with a couple fatal pushes in our hands. So, sorry you didn't get to see that uh, that Drowner of Hope hit the field. But that's what they did. And that is uh, basically how we got wrecked. So, our worst fears came to pass with that hand that we kept. I don't think it's one we were supposed to throw back. But, yeah, we, we were a little bit too low to the ground. A little bit too... Uh, we had a little bit too many of our stuff that isn't necessarily lining up the best against Thought Knots into Reality Smashers into Drowners of Hope, right? So combine that with missing our land drops for way too long. Yeah, we just kind of got wrecked. So, um, well, that's kind of what Bantel Drazi does. They curved out on us, and we, we couldn't really hang with them. So onward we go to Game 3. Third and final game here against Bantel Drazi. We are on the play, and the hand is fine. It's a little bit threat heavy and a little bit interaction light for my tastes, but it's very functional. It's got a nice uh, turn one tap land and a turn two bob as a reasonable opening couple plays, and we'll have to take it from there. We'll have to really hope the bob finds us some interaction. That's really what we want. Uh, they stirrings for an Eldrazi temple, sure. So. 
pretty good for them. And Inquisition is tempting there, but I think we do have to play the Bob out there, especially because it's not like we have something we have to tap out for turn three, for on turn three anyway. We can still Inquisition next turn. Hopefully it will still be live next turn. Um, but once again, you see the, the, the downfalls of Inquisition of Kozilek in this matchup, uh, potentially. But regardless, opponent's got to play. And it's an EE on two. All right, well, you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of okay with that because now we can kind of play around that. We're going to come out ahead on tempo because they're going to invest four mana into that total and on card advantage because Bob is going to find us some action. So Inquisition of Kozilek is what he flips and uh, draw for turn is a Blooming Mars. So Inquisition is going to see this hand. Here's that Drowner of Hope that made the, the replay bug out last game, just for those of you who don't know, so you can check it out. It's a 5-5 five, five for 6, Devoid but Blue. Um, makes 2-1-1 one, one colorless Eldrazi Scion, uh, and you can sack an Eldrazi Scion to tap target creature. So, of course, lots of synergies between the, uh, the Sky Spawners, making more tokens for this Drowner of Hope, also helping ramp into the Drowner of Hope, as the case may be. But we see Rest in Peace as well. Not a card that particularly cripples us here, but at the same time, there's no real reason not to take it away, in my opinion. Um, so I'm pretty happy to just use my Inquisitions while they're good, take away both of those cards, and uh, crack in for two with the Bob. So Bob is pulling us ahead here. Again, we got the tempo advantage, we got the card advantage, we even got two points of damage in, and they have nothing going on except that Drowner of Hope, which is admittedly a pretty big bomb but Eldrazi Temple cracked the explosives back to us. So it is tireless tracker time. Play the tracker, play the tomb, make a clue, pass to you. Opponent's got that second Eldrazi Temple. So they get the, uh, the turn four Drowner of Hope, which is pretty nice um, that they didn't have to you know, cash in any other cards to use it. They just naturally ramped with a couple soul lands here. <laughs> pretty, pretty balanced, am I right? But regardless, at least they, at least they don't have anything else going on. And thankfully, the Drowner didn't crash the replay client this time, so life is good. Uh, we draw a Dark Confidant. That's actually just fine with me. And here, I think we don't mess around. I think we're just going to trophy away this Drowner of Hope before they find, like, uh, before they find, what's it called, the Eldrazi Displacer, other ways to potentially protect it from removal. We just want to take care of this while we can. It's a big 5-5. Five five. We don't want it around as a body. We don't want them to somehow blink it and get more Scions and just tempo us out of the game. So we do that main phase before we do anything else just to make them decide whether to sack a Scion while it's still around, and indeed they do. So, sure, we could go Scoos here, we could go Bob here, I just chose the Bob, you know, they're both viable in my opinion, but we're still at a really high life total, and they're still at a really high life total, and we're low on cards, so I think I'd rather play the Bob there. Noble Hierarch, sure. Windswept Heath as well. They still got two cards in hand. They're gonna try to, uh, try to get us to trade here. We're not gonna. We'll take the two. Uh, very exalted scion there, and they pass back to us. So Maelstrom Pulse is a painful flip off of Bob, but it is a good safety valve to have in this situation. And Fatal Push was a pretty good draw, too. I'm inclined to crack a clue here. I really want to find a land. All right, we don't find a land, but we find a Fatal Push. So, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty happy to just push the Hierarch, I guess, clear the way, and make sure my attacks are are going to come across here. We're, we're just clocking. Again, we really wanted to land here to keep the clue chain rolling and to keep developing our mana, but uh, it's not to be, and we will have to console ourselves with the fact that we they don't seem to just not really have anything else. So even though that was not as good as it could have been, still pretty fine if you ask me. The opponent is going to play an Eldrazi Displacer, sure. And they're getting frisky with that Scion. All right. We take one. They're passing to us one card in hand. Bob is going to reveal a Tarmogoyf. 
Again, we're taking more pain than we want to off of Bob, but the good news is that we're ahead on resources and on board, so it's not that big of an issue. Uh, we do also find a land to make a clue. And here I do like digging. Okay, another land. So here, you know, let's see if they've got anything to do, anything to say with this Eldrazi Displacer in response. Do note that it's exile another target creature, so it can't protect itself from the Fatal Push, but it can activate twice here with triple Eldrazi Temple. That's pretty good. So they get to reset our Tireless Tracker. And they just get to tap our bot for the turn, basically. So it's a good defensive play, but I'm happy with it. We're, to, we're playing out the Tarmogoyf, and we're passing. Again, they don't really seem like they have all that much else going on, but of course they do have a scary top deck. However, a 6-7 Tarmogoyf should line up well against just about anything they can find. And it's an EE on 2. Okay. That's a really good find. So they get to two for one. That's one of the best uh, catch-up cards they could have. However, the power of Tireless Tracker is just going to keep everything rolling for us. So Inquisition first, we'll just, before we decide whether to crack clues aggressively, what else to do, we're just going to spot check the hand. So they have nothing as we anticipated. So it's time to go crazy with value. Crack the clue. And we'll attack. Sure, happy to just get chumped there and develop the board. Um, I'm going to play Scooze there. I think we have lethal. So we have such overkill with lethal with these two man lands here that I'd rather play the Scooze and uh, stop like any Eternal Witness shenanigans, anything like that. And uh, Scooze more or less contributes just as well as Goyf does to ending the game. And we're not at, loose, at risk of losing the game this turn. Goyf is also a better standalone threat if they somehow wipe the board, right? So for all those reasons, I think Scooze is the play. And look, this was like the most aggressive and one of the best general rips they could have off the top, but it can't really afford to attack. Of course, all they can do is really block with it. So end step will crack a clue. And we have a Liliana of the Veil, so that is just lovely. Just like in game one, Liliana shows up right on the decisive turn for the coup de gras cleanly edicting away a reality smasher not many better feelings in magic than liliana edict on a smasher and we get to swing in for exactly lethal without even having to crack a clue or feed the scoos or fire up a manland very stylish kill my friends very nice very nice and the value of tireless tracker and dark confidant working in tandem once again ran away with this game now we we had to stay in it they they put together a lot of good stuff that Drowner of Hope was a, was a good top end, even though we stripped their hand out early pretty well. And then they found some decent stuff. They found a Displacer. They found an EE to catch back up. They found a Smasher. These are all cards that are good top decks. But you know what? We had the value. We had the proactivity. And we got there. So, um... So far, I've been really liking the four Dark Confidants. Most people are either playing a 3-3 Bob and Tracker split... Or they're cutting a tracker to make room for that fourth bob. So it's either 3-3 or 4-2. I'm playing 4-3 right now for this month, and I understand that you're giving up equity elsewhere to do that. But man, oh man, do I like these card advantage engines in this deck. And uh, so far in these first two games in the league, first two matches in the league, rather, both Confidant and Tracker have showed up huge. So good games, well played to the opponent. We take down Bant Eldrazi 2-1, and we advance to 2-0 in the league. Hope you guys are enjoying this league. A couple of grind fests so far, but we've got three more rounds to play. I'll see you for the third one. All right, my friends, round three, and this hand is weird. We've lost the die roll yet again. We lost all the die rolls so far. Hand's a little weird because... Kalidus and Scooze are both a little bit redundant in terms of what they do. Like, they kind of reward us for killing creatures. They're main deckable, life gain, slash grave hate. Um, in, in that sense, having them alongside Fatal Push is nice. But we've got a little bit of redundancy. We're a little light on gas overall. It's just kind of a strange hand, but I... You know, if, if we're against, like, Ad Nauseam or something, we're just dead. Right? But I think this hand is a keep in a blind game one. 
and the opponent leads on a hissing quagmire, so we're pretty sure it's the mirror match, in which case I'm happy I kept any functional 7, and this one looks fine. Um, opponent will play a Dark Confidant. Well, that's a good card. And now I'm a little... I, I do... I am punished pretty hard for playing the Treetop Village there, even though it was correct, because now I want to push in Thoughtseize. Obviously can't do that with one of my... Uh, one of my lands producing only green, so we just Fatal Push. I'm glad I have an answer to Bob of any kind, don't get me wrong. But... Yeah, so they play Swamp, they will Thought Seize us, and they take away our Thought Seize. Interesting. Makes me wonder what else they've got. They've got a Tarmogoyf, so they're playing the Tarmogoyf out into a known Fatal Push, which might make us want to consider what we do here. However, um, Dark Confidant is a good draw, and I think it's correct to play the Bob over the Scoos there, because if the Bob lives, he has higher immediate impact on this game. If he does not live... Well, it just makes the Scoos even better as something that comes down later on, right? So we can sandbag our push for now, see what they do. All right, they're going to push our Bob, sure. And they have a Scoos of their own. Very interesting here. So they don't have a fourth land drop, or at least they haven't showed us one yet. So you could go either way here, but that actually kind of makes me want to push the Goyf, because now, in theory, I can... Yep, they don't have the fourth land, so I can kind of start outgrowing their Scoos with my own, and I think that's what I'm going to do rather than play Kalidus. Remember, they left Kalidus in our hand with a Thought Seize as well, taking away our Thought Seize. So I think we have to assume they have an answer for Kalidus, and therefore I'm pretty happy to kind of deploy my Scoos and say, all right, my Scoos is now outgrowing yours. Are you going to be able to compete with that? Or do you have to spend your answer on that, and then maybe our Kalidus can take over? Uh, opponent finds the fourth land. It is a treetop village. Ooh, they have another Thought Seize. That's a good spot to find another Thought Seize. Down goes Kalidus. And their Scoos gets to gobble up both of these uh, creatures in the yard. So now we've got the Scoos standoff of ages. And by the way, our opponent here, day by day, super cool character. Super cool, friendly opponent. Um, we started spitballing here, we started talking about the Scoo standoff, and, uh, yeah, we, we had a nice chat, so if you're watching this day by day, uh, thanks for the good game and thanks for the friendly conversation. So, we've got the BGX Civil War, and because I have another Scoo's in hand, I really want to trade here. Really want to trade off. The opponent, um, wisely declines, but, so attacking there is good for me, because I am ahead on life, so... If they, if they don't trade, then at least I'm I'm the one. I'm kind of the aggro here. So I think that was the correct attack. Unfortunately, another Scoos is not great. Another Blooming Marshes is, is definitely not great, right? So they're going to fire up the Treetop Village, and now they get to uh, become the aggro themselves. So they're going to crack us for seven, and there's not much we can do about it besides take the hit. All right. Opponent has a Dark Confidant. Oh, boy pretty rough. So here I just kind of, there's no real reason to. I'm just kind of sending a message, you know? I'm just kind of saying, you know what? I'm going to eat your graveyard. I'm going to win the Scoos War one way or another, but I'm not winning the Top Deck War. Another Blooming Marsh is just about as bad as it can possibly be. We'll play one of them out to develop our mana. Opponent gets a Field of Ruin off of Bob. Well, that's very good for them. It's painless, and it lets them take care of our Treetop Village. So at this point, I'm just kind of, again, continuing to eat away at their graveyard for no real reason. But you know what? Uh, here's a little bit of a, of a catch-up play for me. The opponent's got an Inquisition, and we've just got a land in hand, so sure. Uh, we're back to standoff mode, and I guess that's okay with me. And here we're just eating the graveyard again just, just for fun, because we're talking about the Scoozes and <laughs> the Scooz Wars. Uh, but we can't catch a break. Can't catch a break, so we just have to pass. Really hoping the opponent uh, bricks as well, but even if they do, they've got the manlands on board and we don't. And look, we've got them eating our graveyard back, so Tarmogoyfs are going to be bad from here <laughs> on out, but regardless, uh, the Dark Confidant advantage is pretty real. The Bob flips another Bob, so maybe there is a world in which we can, you know, kind of 
hope their bob triggers do a lot of damage and maybe turn the corner quickly. But for now, I think we just have to be patient. Got to take the hit from Hissing Quagmire. We could trade our ooze off with it, but I don't think that's worth it. And uh, at this point, we just... Yeah, we're just top decking lands. What are you going to do? Top decking lands that don't do anything. Opponent finds a trophy off of Bob. We are well and truly behind. They're going to trophy away our big scoos. And they're going to fire up Treetop. Okay. So they, they sent in all three. They sent in all three, and I kind of understand, like, just wanting to force some damage through because they have another Bob in hand, and having two Bobs on field at once can be a little bit of a liability. Nevertheless, I think that attack was still a little loose. I think you might want to just sandbag that Bob, because now I get to take this block, and I get to gain another life, right? That's the reason I think it's a little loose, is because I get to gain another life, and now... My ooze is big enough to block their ooze yet again, in, in, or indeed to just block the treetop village, right? So, we draw Liliana the Veil. Alright, you know, that's not the worst. Not the worst at all. Um, there are better draws, but there are worse ones as well. So they're going to sack their scoos. Keep the bob around. So our scoos is a 5-5. Five five. Now here it was actually really interesting to, to consider the attack for a hot second, but look at their man lands. Killing us, dying on the crackback is not what I'm trying to do. Now, granted, they need to spend this green mana to fire up the treetop village, but then we are just dead to a top-decked, untapped Greenland, right? So I think we have to play defense, and they flip a Liliana of the Veil off of their Bob. So as soon as we get a good draw, the opponent matches us with a Liliana of their own. Uh, so we're pretty dead at this point, pretty far behind. And there, Bob takes care of our Lily. The fact that they didn't attack with a man land was worrisome, and yeah, they have a tireless tracker, and we just end the game with a triple swamp in hand. So, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I don't think we did anything wrong there. I think we played well throughout. I think we, uh, you know, not that there were any super secret <laughs> lines that we took. I just think we made pretty much the right decisions at every turn, and sometimes you just flood out in these mirror matches. So, uh, not much to be said about that one. It was a good game, it was interesting, but eventually, as so often is the case, came right down to the top decks and we got buried by Dark Confidant after we flooded out. So, um, that's all, uh, that's all to be said about that. Let's take a quick look at the sideboard. Alright, my friends, you've seen me do this before, but for those who haven't, we'll, we'll take a quick look. We like threats and answers in this matchup. So EE, e. Pulse, Damnation, Kitchen Finks, all very goodness, a vital force, Liliana the Last Hope, both amazing. I'm not so much a fan of Collective Brutality. Um, Deathmark is, is very, very good. We have a lot to do in the mirror match, so much that we're not going to be able to bring everything in. Um, and I don't have a single card in here that's specifically dedicated to mid-range. It's just we can leverage a lot of the cards very well that are there for other matchups predominantly in the BGX uh, Civil Wars and the Brothers Wars. So these seven, here's how I side. These seven come in for sure. These five are all playable, but we're not going to have room for them. So let's take a look at what comes out. So we can afford to cut a land, get our threat count higher. It's got to be Blooming Marsh because they're the they're straight Golgari. Field of Ruin and Assassin's Trophy are going to be there in abundance. We got to cut a land that's not a basic. So Blooming Marsh it is. Um, I cut all this card in this matchup, including Collective Brutality, which has other modes, but I still think it's one of our weaker cards. So Thought Seize is gone, IOK is gone, Brutality is gone. So that puts us at 59 cards. We're going to be on the play, and everything else in our deck is great. Everything else is great. So Fulminator Mage is great too, but it's not as great against Golgari as it is against Jundar Absin. But we'll still play one to round out the, the 60 and call it good. And if there's a game three on the draw, I think Liliana the Veil just gets a tad worse on the draw, so I will cut one on the draw and play a second Fulminator. I think that's totally reasonable, but regardless, the 60 will look like that for the game you're about to see. Game two on the play in the Golgari Civil War, and our hand, again, it's a little light on gas. Four lands is kind of a lot for an attrition-based matchup, but this hand is a solid keep. You know, we've got a lot of utility, at least out of our land base. We've got threats and answers. That's what we're after. Opponent goes treetop village, pass back to us. 
Damnation is our draw. That's an interesting one. We'll definitely go ahead and play out the Tarmogoyf here. See what the opponent can muster. All right, Swamp, Tarmogoyf. Fair enough. Okay, Dark Confidant is our draw. So the Damnation is a little bit potentially awkward now because it looks like our best line is Death Mark into Bob in Attack with a Goyf. This means we have actively spent resources, though, s trading one for one with their board, which makes Damnation worse. We want Damnation to be as big of an X for one as possible. On top of that, our board is going wide. We've got two creatures down already by turn three if we do that, which is going wide by our standards, right? So it's worth considering whether we want to play more cagely and, and kind of lean on the Damnation, but... I think this line is too good to pass up. Just death mark into Bob into an attack for two. That's a pretty solid turn turn three for us, right? So the opponent's got Blooming Marsh and Assassin's Trophy for the Bob. Sure, I'll take that. Land all day, and the Goyf has grown, and we draw Liliana of the Veil. Vale. That is a good draw. That is a good draw. We're going to attack with the Goyf to see if we can draw out a uh, Fatal Push kind of before giving them any information, although playing the Liliana w first would have been interesting as well simply to grow the Goyf, but it's kind of a toss-up. You could go either way. And here, I'm just going to pitch the land. Uh, again, Damnation is looking... We don't know how good it's going to be necessarily, but I think for at least one turn we can afford to hang on to it pitch a land instead. Opponent pitches a forest. Back to them. Alright, they're tapping out Liliana of their own. Sure, you know, they'll edict away our goif, and they'll play a tomb tapped. Alright, this is, seems like a pretty good position to me. Kitchen Finks is a heck of a draw here. It's an absolute heck of a draw, so I could do one of two things. I can pressure their Liliana off the board of my Hissing Quagmire and tick up, or I could simply play the Kitchen Finks, which is a very high-value card, and then tick up. So, first thing we're going to do is tick up to see what they do. I think either way, Damnation is the correct pitch, no matter what we're going to do. So we'll tick up first to give them as little info as possible, to get more info to inform our decision. They pitch a Kalidus, well, that seems just fine to me. And yeah, you know, I'm thinking here, Kitchen Finks is the play. Kitchen Finks is the play. I don't want to lose the Finks, and... You know, they could have another Liliana. They'd, they'd tick her up. Who knows? Um, so here, I think Finks is the guaranteed two-for-one, so I would rather play that than take care of their Liliana, but we'll see if I come to regret that. They have another Kalidus. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty nice for them, having had to pitch the first one. But here is what's interesting, my friends. The opponent must have a very good hand because they don't tick up. They don't tick up, and that's just fine with me because we get to hang on to Trophy. Now, it's a little bit awkward, though, because we really wanted to find something that we could play, anything that we could play this turn. Like, a land here would be just fine, right? Anything that we could play out to the board and empty our hand, then take our Liliana up, but it was not to be. So, instead, we just have to kind of take Lily of the Veil down. Totally fine with me taking care of Kalidus. Lily of the Veil is still on three. In this way, we don't have to empty our hand ourselves, right? So Kitchen Finks will go ahead and answer their Lily of the Veil. And then I think we just play the Lily the Last Hope, get the guaranteed value, tick her down. You could buy back Tarmogoyf or Dark Confidant. I think the game is still grindy. The life totals are still high. We want the card advantage engine. We want the Bob. Now, this also makes it so they cannot... Uh, totally answer our Planeswalkers on the crackback unless they have, like, land into Decay plus Treetop Village activation, right? So they're going to kill our Kitchen Finks with a Collective Brutality. That is so fine with me, I cannot even tell you. That is that is so, so fine with me. Finks comes back, and we get to untap with both our Planeswalkers. Well, that seems amazing to me, my friends. We're going to tick up. Uh, you could go a few different ways here, but I just said we're going to play out to the board. The only way this is bad is if they have Languish or Damnation. Otherwise, we are just pretty much in an unbeatable position. And you know what? Even if they have Languish and Damnation, well, 
we're still going to have our Lilianas around after the, the board wipe is there, is done. So I chose to hold back the things. You could have attacked either way, but kind of wanted to protect the Planeswalkers a little bit again because my position is so unassailable um, if, I keep, if I keep them around. And regardless, the opponent does not have enough to compete with this board, so they take their draw step, they go ahead and scoop it on up. So that was a, that was a feel-good uh, game two here in the mirror match, the Deathmark into Dark Confidant turn three, having played a Tarmogoyf turn two. Uh, that was a very, a very efficient turn, and pretty much no matter what they had for turn three, I was still going to be in a decent position going into my turn four. That is why I think it is correct to take the play here in these BGX mirrors, even though it's a lot about resource advantage, and even though you'll see, for example, a canny Grixis Shadow player will often take the draw against us um, just for that extra card and, and things like that. I still really like having the play here. Uh, lets you get aggressive with sometimes a double spell turn or even just getting the being the first one to get a Liliana down is amazing. So yeah, I, I, I think the power of being on the play was shown there. And, uh, and that was a fun game, but you know, we're going to be on the draw for game three. Let's see what happens. All right, my friends, here it is, the uh, the decisive game in match three. It's been three slogs. It's been three long, grindy games, and we love the interactive stuff. But, man, I'm fatigued even doing the replay, but it's been fun. And we like our hand here. We like our hand. It's got a lot to like. Uh, lots of gas, very well-balanced uh, lands-to-spells ratio. And, look, our opponent likes their seven as well. So good old Golgari Mirror, all three games uh both players keeping the full seven so no free wins here no free losses here either uh treetop village and pass all right the opponent has his turn turn two scavenging use fair enough hissing quagmire is our draw that's an interesting one um so normally as you've heard me say probably many times by now i am a little bit weird wary excuse me of playing a turn two creature in the BGX mirror just right out on turn two into a possible turn three Liliana when I'm on the draw. A big exception, though, a big reason I'm cool with it is if I have a treetop village, because if they go land Liliana, edict your bob, I can attack back with the treetop village and kill their Liliana, and the Scoos can't even protect that because I'm a 3-3 three, three trample. This thing's still going to be a grizzly bear next turn if they tap out for Lily. So... Um, it would have been very interesting to decide whether or not to play that Confidant if I didn't have Treetop Village, but because I do, I more or less have Carte Blanche. Now if they have a Liliana the Last Hope, that's just the biggest blowout imaginable, but, you know, you can't play scared of that card. Gotta make them have it. And they do indeed have just the, <laughs> the, the regular Liliana. Sure, fair enough. Then, this was a super interesting moment. A <laughs> super interesting moment. The opponents got Surgical Extraction in against us. You guys know my opinion on this. I don't think it's correct to bring in Surgical Extraction. I don't think it's correct for basically any deck to bring in Extraction against me. Um, I've seen it happen before. We'll see it happen again, and we're seeing it happen now. Um, however, it works out okay for the opponent here because we just so happen to have a Dark Confidant in hand. If uh, th And even so, like this is like the best... Not the literal best case scenario, but um, one of one of the better case scenarios for which it's a fairly low likelihood to happen. And even so, it's still just a a one for one trade. Like their extraction trades with the bob in my hand. And sure, they're all out of my deck, but I don't think that's the most relevant. But you know, I'm I'm willing to entertain other opinions on this for sure. But anyway, we last thing I expected, we get our bob extracted. So no more bobs this game. We'll have to. We'll have to try to win through other means. Assassin's Trophy is a, uh, a good draw. It's just more action. It's just more guess. And I'm very happy here to fire up the Treetop Village, take care of the Liliana. This does a couple things. Number one, it obviously answers the Liliana. Number two, it means that maybe our opponent will, you know, just play out more creatures and play into a damnation, right? So, opponent has Kalidus Trader of Get. Okay, well, that's what I call playing into a damnation. Not that they did anything wrong to do that, um, but 
a, any kind of a two-for-one in this matchup is fine, especially a two-for-one on these cards. So here I was saying, one time untapped land off the top, show me the untapped land one time, and the deck complies, Verdant Catacombs off the top, beautiful thing, and I am so happy to just damnation away Kalidus and Scavenging News. So, we have successfully maintained parity, and we are actually ahead on resources now by one card. So, and we've got a lot of gas in hand, but the opponent's got some stuff to do as well, and they're just gonna gobble up some things with the scoos. Still two cards in hand. Deathmark. Now, Deathmark is a good draw here. Very happy to just Deathmark away the scoos. And unfortunately, we cannot be perfectly mana efficient because uh, we didn't have double black there for Fulminator, but Tarmogoyf is... Yeah, I, I still actually, I think I would have played the Fulminator there. It's better against a Liliana of the Veil and, and things like that. But they have a Fatal Push here. Sure. You know. That's just another reason it would be nice to run out the Fulminator there. Not only mana efficient, but very good against Liliana Edict, against Fatal Push, against all that stuff. The opponent has a push and they're going to pass. I don't really know what else they could have. It might just be a handful of spot removal. But we have to be wary of a Damnation on the other side of the table too, or indeed a Languish. This is another reason I love Fulminator Mage, guys. We can play two creatures out here, and even if they damnation us, we still get value off of the Fulminator. Doesn't look like they have damnation, though, because they're going to trophy our Goyf on our unstep. Sure. We'll take the ramp. We've got Manlands on field. And the opponent's got a... Tr they're going to trophy the Treetop Village here. Okay. You know, I think that's a little aggressive, to be honest. I think you there's no real reason not to sandbag that trophy for maybe a, a more must-answer threat or at least make me tap out for the treetop to get a tempo advantage, right? But as things stand, you know, sure, it's it's another piece of action that they got. So here, uh, partially because I drew another hissing quagmire and partially because I don't have anything better to do, I'm firing up the quagmire. We're going to turn our 2-2 uh, our two -two sideways. Coming across for 4 Opponent's got nothing, and we will play out another Quagmire and pass holding up Trophy. This is a very nice place to be. If the opponent left in discard, which I don't have reason to believe that they did, but we see that some BGX players do leave in the discard, we can Trophy the Quagmire in response. We can Trophy just about anything else they're going to do, too. Uh, we're pretty resilient against all forms of interaction right now, thanks to the redundancy of our manlands, the instant speed nature of Trophy in our hand, and, of course, Fulminator Mage being able to sack in response. So we don't have the most overtly powerful cards around right now, but I feel like we're in a very good position nonetheless. They have a Tarmogoyf. That's a good blocker, and we are just going to trophy it. We're just going to uh, spend our turn efficiently here. There is an argument for taking our draw step first, right? Seeing what the top deck yields. And maybe we'll draw a Fatal Push, and we'd rather push the Goyf and hold on to the Trophy for all the reasons I mentioned. However, the reason to be mana efficient and do it there is if we draw an untapped land here, we can fire up both Quagmires, and wouldn't you know it, we draw an untapped land. So uh, our lines have been rewarded here. I think we're we're taking taking the right lines for the most part. I do respect my life total at this point enough to just go get a basic. You know, eventually I might run out of basics. There's only one left. Who cares? We've got we've got all the lands we need at this point, right? It's not that big a deal. So, uh, we yes yeah, successfully connect for six. Both Quagmires and Fulminator coming across. The two twos are, are getting the job done here. See what the opponent has. It's a scavenging ooze. That's a pretty good one. And it looks as though they're just going to main phase these activations uh, to play around any shenanigans we could put together. I suppose we draw scoos of our own. All right. Interesting draw. Interesting draw, and I do like it. It's definitely a fine one here. And uh, because they have a Scooz on board, we're just going to finish eating up the uh, the relevant stuff in their graveyard. And we get to fire up a Hissing Quagmire and get two points of damage across, kind of rolling the clock back on that life gain that they got last turn. So, pretty nice efficient turn for us. We are kind of totally shields down. We'll have to see what they... What they have. Field of Ruin. Okay, that can answer one of our man lands at least, and it looks like that's what they're going to do. Again, I don't know how necessary it was to main phase that, but... 
Liliana of the Veil. All right, that's a good one. That's a good one. And here we just have to sacrifice our Fulminator and let our let our Scoos uh, stick around. But our Scoos is now officially outclassed by the opposing Scoos. Very unfortunate. Very, very unfortunate. But so good enough for me. And yeah, I, I do now with the way their mana played out, that was correct to main phase the Field of Ruin there. So uh, that is totally fair. So here I like uh, just firing up the Quagmire. If we pressure the Liliana off the field, that's good. If they want to keep the Lily around and trade away their Scoos, that's even better. The Death Touch of Quagmire proving very relevant. People like to bash this land. I think it's good. I think it's pretty decent, all things considered. It uh, fixes our mana well. It provides a good mana sink. And, you know, the body and the Death Touch are not irrelevant. That is for sure. We're seeing it come up big this game. We, uh, we saw it come up big last round against Eldrazi as well. Opponent draws another Field of Ruin, so they're not exactly drawing gas, but at least their lands are taking care of our Quagmire, so that's, uh, that is decent for them. That is decent for sure. We draw Maelstrom Pulse. At first I was excited because I saw removal, and then I realized, no, it's going to kill my Scoos too. Now, yeah, I guess you could do that. I guess you could say we're going to kill all the Scoozes, and then we're just both in top deck mode, but I don't see a good reason to do that. This is bad if they have, like, Liliana tick her up or whatever, but I think we're supposed to hang on to that. Uh, the opponent is eating Manlands here, and they told me in chat that they saw Nyssa in my deck when they did Surgical Extraction on me, and so they're taking away the Manlands that she can buy back, which is a heads-up play, so, so well done to the opponent. Um, however, they, they told me that, like, during this turn, right? So... I think it was a bit of a jinx, because <laughs> then we just rip Nyssa right off the top. What a good draw at any stage, at any point in these late games where you side her, and she's just awesome. So the opponent's just going to scooze away the last uh, man land. And partially because they did that, I guess, but also might have done this anyway. I just want to take Nyssa up, make a land here. So this is really, really an interesting spot. We can attack with a Swamp and then what? Well, they can trade off with the Scoos. Or they can trade off with a Hissing Quagmire. They can attempt to trade off with a Hissing Quagmire. If they fire it up, they we can block it. Uh, or, excuse me, we can, we can sack our Fulminator and make it so they can't block. But then they can... Then it'll be interesting trying to compete over that Fulminator with the two Scooses. There's just a lot of moving pieces here. And then they can potentially kill Nyssa on the crackback. So, here's the other factor. Look at the clock. The opponent is at f under 4 minutes. I'm at 12. So, I'm... And I'm at 15 life. I'm ahead on resources. I have a good kind of break, cla break glass in case of emergency button in hand. I really... You know, there is the argument for attacking. But I'm like, I think the defensive posture here is actually justifiable, too. And look, I'm rewarded for it because they just ripped a Blooming Marsh off the top. They've got no... Great action in hand. And they're going to fire up the Quagmire, trying to pressure the Nyssa out of alt range. And you know what? At this stage, I'm actually pretty happy to trade a Swamp for their Hissing Quagmire. Totally fine with me. I get to keep my Fulminator around, which is good for a lot of reasons. And we draw a Field of Ruin, so that's not the most exciting. However, it is a land. And remember how good Nyssa's emblem is. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. Well, again, it feels a little bit feels a little bit sketchy to just animate a land as a defensive uh, as a defensive uh, piece of the puzzle and pass. Again, because we're at the mercy of their top deck, because we are the aggro, they're at a lower life total. But the upsides are huge, and you know it's paying off for us because they're just drawing lands. At least that's a man land, but definitely. Very glad to fade like Maelstrom Pulse or Assassin's Trophy there. So we draw another land, so we are just off to the races. Now we're very happy to emblem the Nyssa. Now we just have to not lose, because the late game is ours. The late game is ours. The Nyssa emblem is very hard to beat when we're this far ahead, both on board and on the clock. However, the first draw of Nyssa shows us Fatal Push. So that is actually even better than we could have hoped for, because now we just get to go ahead and, and swing. We clear the way, we, we control the board, we control the resources, 
and they're at one. So uh, the line there of, of taking a very defensive posture with Nissa did pay off. And the opponent's got a collective brutality to drain us, and they're going to try to play some D with the treetop, I guess, but the game is just over. Uh, we draw EE, doesn't really matter. We make a land drop, we draw the goif, we animate the land, we send them all in. Treetop Village gets answered by our Field of Ruin, and we have uh, 12 damage coming across, and they're at 3. So if my math checks out, that is indeed game. So, whew, what a, what a league so far, my friends. Three really interactive, really close, really intense matches, and we come out on top of all of them. So once again, uh, pleasure to play against you day by day. That was really fun. Good talk. Um... You know, the, the Rock Mirror matches are, we both kind of agreed that they're they're really cool and they're really not cool at the same time because, like, the games themselves are, there's a lot of cool stuff that happens, but the outcome is a little bit out of our hands if both players are of similar skill level. It comes down maybe more to, to variance than we'd like, right? But regardless, um, I'm, you know, it, it was a pleasure. It was a good time, good talk, and, and good games well played. And we, we got there. We got there, guys. 3-0 in the league feels great, and uh, yeah, hope you're having fun. Let's see you for round four. We're back, my friends, and we lost the die roll again. You can't win die rolls, but we're winning matches, so I guess I'd prefer the latter to the former. Now, once again, we have another hand that's a little light on gas, but boy, oh boy, are these Inquisitions great in a blind game one. I'm going to keep, and uh, hopefully Bob can make up for our relative lack of action. We'll have to see how it goes. Uh, Mishra's Bobble into Watery Grave looks like Grixis Shadow to me, so that is actually one of the last decks we wanted to see with a very, uh, light on gas hand that can answer Bob's a million different ways. Uh, they, uh, that's definitely pretty bad for us, but regardless, uh, we do get to Inquisition here at least, so we're doing something. And we see, uh, not the scariest hand I've ever seen. We definitely are glad there's no Gurmag Angler over there. So they have Shadow, Dismember, Fatal Push. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could argue for taking a removal spell just in case we draw a threat, but, you know, we've got at least one more discard. We might draw more. I think we just take away the threat. Answering the threats at any stage, any way you can, is usually pretty good against Shadow. Uh, Fatal Push is a fine draw. I play out my Swamp first to play around a Soft Stubborn Denial, and I Inquisition. We see Teamer Battle Rage was the draw. That is not, again, not not the most feared card. I, again, I'm, I'm very happy to fade, like, anglers at this point. They're going to Thought Seize us back, so to be fair, even though their hand isn't great, yeah, we don't have anything, so <laughs> super interesting here. Um, this was a bit of a, of a loose play from me here, so... I looked at my Tarmogoyf, and I looked at the Dismember, and I looked in the yard for instance, and I said, okay, there's already instant in the yard, it's a 4 or 5, it's not going to survive the Dismember, but I didn't realize there were actually no lands there. Uh, so if I had fetched the Verdant Catacombs, and then played the Tarmogoyf, we could have done that there. So that was, uh, that was definitely a missed opportunity on my part to safely deploy the Goyf, however, um, I just, I just kind of hit my land, and then said, oh, shoot, there's no land in there. It just a, went a little bit too quick for my own good. However, they already have one basic land here, so using Field of Ruin here is, is potentially fine. Um, we would rather hit a red land, but that's not possible, so sure, we'll just use it on the Watery Grave. Uh, Inquisition is our draw. That is a fine draw. It's just action. It's, again, we don't care too much about either of those cards, but we might as well take the Dismember. Even though it can't kill Goyf, it can basically read gain five life uh, once they get their, their lands, once they've fetched and all that good stuff. And of course it can answer other threats that we might find as well. So the opponent passes and we are flooding. So we've had a couple okay draws and, and mostly we're just a little bit flooded, but the opponent has not been doing much of anything either. Obviously there are some, you should always ask yourself whether it's actually correct to attack at any given time, really, against Shadow, but here, you know, we've got him on a two-turn clock after this attack, so I think we just turn the Goyf sideways, make him have it. Even Angler does not outsize the Goyf at this point. 
And they draw, and they're just going to pass again. And we draw Hissing Quagmire, so the flood continues. At least that's a man land. And they've got Fatal Push, sure. So, play out the Quagmire, pass it back. Opponent just draws and passes again, so a little bit of draw go here. And a little bit more draw go. Um, we might as well run out that Marsh Flats. I don't think firing up the Hissing Quagmire is worth it. I would... I think... Cracking in for 5 with a Tarmogoyf is good. I don't think cracking in for 2 when they're at 10 is good, especially because that could be walking into, like, Snapcast or Fatal Push. Um, and because if the Tides turn against us, Quagmire is actually a card that can play reasonable defense in this matchup. So uh, here's a little bit of a benefit to our flooding. They're going to Thought Seize our Double Verdant Catacombs hand. However, it does clear the way for their Shadow. So... We will fetch to thin out our deck, and we will rip a Liliana of the Veil right off the top. Well, that is finally some good news from the top of our deck, and they do not have anything in hand besides that Teamer Battle Rage, so we know there's no risk of Stubborn Denial. And now that they're down to six from their fetching and shocking, I do like attacking with Quagmire, because uh, this is now a, a three-turn clock. I think that's a perfectly reasonable distinction to draw between attacking when they were at ten and attacking when they're at six. Uh, Mishra's Bobble. Here's an example of, some people sometimes ask, why don't you just play Bobble in every deck? It's free, it draws a card, it lets you basically play a 56 card deck, and especially in a deck like ours, it can grow the Tarmogoyf. What's the problem? Well, here's the problem. It's when you're in top deck mode, the fact that you can't draw till the beginning of the next turn's upkeep is, uh, you know, it slows you down too much. It's not free, in other words. It's not a free inclusion. So we're going to take up might as well get that TBR out of their hand, get Lily to 6. Obviously, you want to keep Field of Ruin over uh, Catacombs there. Field of Ruin is actually quite effective against them. It's going to be a Stone Rain effect. And we'll attack with the Quag. So, we're going to go ahead and Blood Crypt here. Um, hit the Blood Crypt. I actually... You know what I actually could have done now that I'm looking back is wait for them to crack the bobble. Because let's say they crack the bobble to scry to the top and then, like, they decide to fetch. Or if they don't decide to fetch, we can force them to shuffle again. You know, it's it's just an interesting thing. But we, uh, regardless, we get to stone rain them. It's pretty good either way. If we had to draw land, it might as well have been that one. And they just scoop it up. They just scoop it up. So the hissing quagmire is going to get them next turn. Um... We don't know what they had in hand. They had two cards. Maybe they just had, like, a land and a threat or something, but the threat gets edicted, and the Quagmire is going to finish them off. So definitely, uh, here's an example of just why we have a pretty good matchup against Shadow. They had, they are a deck that interacts very well and polices linear decks very well. But we're not a linear deck. We're a value deck. We're an attrition-based deck. So they have sometimes some cards like, you know, the kill spells, the discard spells, the teamer battle rages, stubborn denial sometimes that just kind of sit in hand in certain uh, circumstances, and therefore they don't necessarily punish us all that hard when we flood. Don't get me wrong, sometimes they can, but we flooded badly this game and we were very low on action for periods of it, and at the end of the day we were still able to outgrind them even though we didn't have like tireless tracker to take advantage of all those lands. We just kind of we just kind of stayed in the game with Manlands, and then we found a Liliana, and a Tarmogoyf was involved. It, um, you know, and our top deck discard, which is normally bad when the game goes long like this, it also becomes decent when they, again, have those cards in hand, those reactive or conditional cards in hand. So um, all that combined with the fact that they play kind of a light threat count, this is why I feel we're favored against Grixis Shadow. So you guys have certainly seen me by now, I would hope, sideboard against this deck, but let's take a quick look at it once again. All right, my friends, so against Grixis Shadow, we want our threats and answers. We're treating it mostly like a mid-range mirror, but we can't quite afford to play something so big and clunky as Nessa. So in many ways, it's a mid-range mirror, but we have to tone... We have to slow our roll a little bit in regard to some things like Nissa, but Pulse, Lily, The Last Hope, Kitchen thinks these cards are all great. Nile Spellbomb and Fulminator Mage are both very, very good, too. Um, and Engineered Explosives, I think, is quite playable. 
Here's the big difference that you haven't necessarily seen before. I have Damnation now, which I never used to. So Languish does not come in against this deck for obvious reasons. It cannot kill Angler or often Shadow. But Damnation can kill all that stuff, so I think we want Damnation too. That's the big difference. We've got these four, maybe all ten of these cards come in, we'll have to see. But um, regardless... I, in the recent past, have been experimenting with leaving one Thought Season. I think that's fine. But now that we have the Damnation, we don't have room to leave in the Thought Season anymore. We just cut all discard, including Collective Brutality. And then, um, I personally sub in up in Explosives for a Fatal Push. We don't want too many things that basically only kill Shadow. I think playing five of these effects is too many. And I slightly rate the EE higher than the Push overall. So... 3 push, 1 EE is totally fine. Then we have... What else do we want to do? Well, I actually kind of like cutting a land in this matchup. And I think that's totally reasonable. Um, it could kind of be a few different ones. In the end, At the end of the day, I usually cut basic forest. But it's not the worst idea to cut like a treetop village just because we do need... To play on curve as well, but I usually opt to cut the forest over the village. And uh, Nile Spellbomb is a good solid card in the matchup. Fulminator Mage is very, very good too, but I think I like the second Spellbomb more than the third Fulminator Mage. So with my new look uh, 75, my sideboarding against Shadow is going to look something like that most games. So that's what we did, and I will see you for game two. Alright everybody, this is not the type of hand we want to see against Shadow. Not at all. Um, only two spells to five lands is an awful ratio, but you know what? Mulling is awful too. So, the here are the upsides. Tarmogoyf is good in the matchup. I mean, is our only real threat. We don't expect it to survive, but it's still a fine one. Fulminator Mage is a strong, strong card too. And we have a lot of utility out of our land base. So, I just about talked myself into keeping this one. Um, mostly because mulling is probably going to be just as bad. Um, you know, mulling to like a really good six, it, first of all, you could get not a really good six, and secondly, they could just rip apart that hand and then you're just kind of down on resources anyway, right? So we got to kind of put our faith in the top of the deck here. Keep our seven. Uh, they lead on steam vents and divisions, okay. Well, we promptly draw a land, so that's not very good. And uh, do note that, like I mentioned earlier in the league, uh, our shadow opponent has taken the draw against us. This is uh, this is definitely not uncommon. Another Serum Visions, and then a Polluted Delta in pass. So, Serum Visions before Delta, that's interesting. That's interesting for sure. So, I really like just playing the Fulminator Mage here, and immediately Stone Raining them, because... The fact that I've drawn two lands running when I kept a five land opener means we need high upside things to, to go right for us to win. If we just take the safer lines, I it I mean, the top deck, anything could happen, right? But I don't really... I mean, we, we have a totally empty hand as far as spells are concerned. So I think we need to kind of hope that they... Um, that they kind of get stuck on lands after we hit the hit them with the stone rain effect. Number two, steam vents is a very very good land to hit. Hitting any red lands in general, with fulminator is pretty nice. Number three, this is now perhaps incentivizing them even more to crack the polluted delta, which is going to ruin the scrying they've done with serum vision. So all of those things considered, that is why I went ahead and. Uh, immediately stone rained. Now they do cycle with the street wraith, so they get to see at least one of the cards they put to the top, but regardless, uh, they push the goif and they pass, and we pass to them, rather. Alright, so whenever you see paying costs and it takes them a while, you pretty much know the Gurmag Angler is coming. So Angler into Island, that's pretty rough for us. However, uh, here's yet another reason we aggressively stone rain with the Fulminators. We, of course, have Field of Ruin in hand. So at the time, it's like, we might literally have nothing else to do besides field them. We draw Dark Confidant. This is actually a good draw, because it lets us field them now, and then play the Bob. Now, granted, 
If they have exactly Fatal Push in hand, this lets them have a more mana-efficient turn. So that was the risk that we took, the calculated risk, but they don't have it, so good enough for me. Um, they're going to cycle a Wraith, they're going to play a Watery Grave. All right, well, at least they're off of red. And they have a Liliana of the Veil. All right, they sack, they force us to sack, and then they attack with the Angler. Now, this is interesting. Now, granted, they don't know that our hand is totally devoid of, of anything, but... It might have been interesting for them to keep the Angler back and protect the Liliana with a known treetop village on field, right? But regardless, they decide to start clocking, and that's actually perfect for me, because now I get to answer the Liliana, who is a big problem for us. We get to answer the Liliana, and we drew yet another uh, two-drop. So we've had some decent top decks. You know, they're just creatures with without any, you know, ETBs or, or ways to get guaranteed value before removal like Tireless Tracker can. But at least they've let us have really efficient turns. First we had Field into Bob, and now we have Treetop Attack into Goyf, right? That said, we're down to eight. They have an Angler on hand, they've got a fairly full grip, and now they have Red Mana again. So, not necessarily sure what we're uh, expecting here, but... Another Gurmag Angler, and they conspicuously leave up the blue source of Just Island. They didn't even leave up Watery Grave. That's a pretty telegraphed Stubborn Denial, or a very good bluff for Stubborn Denial. Um, regardless, we don't have anything that can get stubbed this turn. All we can really do is play out this Tireless Tracker, and play out our Hissing Quagmire, which, to be fair, is a good blocker for... Um, you know, if we can extend the game. So there are some things that we are fairly dead to right now, but they're going to attack with both, and I think we have to go for the double block. If they've got Fatal Push, they've got Fatal Push. We've got to try to get... We've got to try to take the double block here. There's definitely no point chumping, chumping, just to try to, like, top deck a Damnation or a Pulse, especially when we assume they have Stubborn Denial, right? So we go for the double block, we crack a clue. There's a Pulse. Okay, a little late, perhaps, but... Still a good draw. And they don't have the push or anything else. So we trade Tracker for an Angler. That is okay. They will follow up with a Serum Visions. And I, I kind of wonder if they should have cast that Serum before they attacked. Maybe they could have found, like, Pulse, uh, you know, Push or, or whatever. But regardless, we draw Liliana of the Veil. All right, this is super interesting. Very, very good draw, too, because now we have two powerful three-drop spells, that, and we have exactly six untapped mana. Uh, so I think we just have to try to jam these spells, and I think Pulse is the one to start off on. Pulse will resolve. Interesting. So maybe they don't have the stub, or maybe they chose not to use it, but I have to imagine... They would have probably cast it if they had it. So for that reason, I didn't shock in the tomb to play around a soft stubborn denial here. But wouldn't you know it, they do indeed have the stub. So they get to soft stub the Liliite. You know, maybe I'm missing something. But regardless, that's how they did it. And we get to hit him for five. So we've got two man lands on field. We will deploy our overgrown tomb so that we can activate them both next turn. So we've got three attackers coming across next turn, all for lethal. They thought Scour to draw, and then they just scoop it up, so whatever they have in hand is not sufficient to kill and or block three attackers. And at the narrow, uh, with a narrow margin of victory sitting here at three life, having faced down a couple Gurmag Anglers just a few short turns before, we are able to turn the corner and we're able to win. So, um, yeah, very, very, very close game here, but... At the end of the day, we come out victorious against Grixis Shadow, which has become the norm for me. I, again, I think it's a very solid matchup for us. And long, long may Shadow remain at the top of the meta, right? Because they do, they're a very cool deck in their own right, very interactive, very thematic and fun. They do a really good job of policing a lot of the linear degenerate crap of this format. And on top of all that, we've got a nice, solidly favorable matchup against them, so... We we want to see Shadow do well, right, guys? We want to see Shadow do well, and we take them down here. We advance to 4-0. Very, very exciting. We're playing for the 5-0, and let's check it out. I'll see you for the next round. Fifth and final round, my friends. Playing for the trophy, playing for the undefeated 
and mortality, getting published, all that stuff. And once again, we lose the die roll. We've lost all five die rolls this league. But what do we think of our hand? Uh, once again, it's a little land heavy, but this time we know we need the lands for Tracker and Kalidas, right? Um, it is slow. I really wish I was on the play with this hand. But I think it is a keep in a blind game one. We don't know what we need at all. We don't know what we need whatsoever. Hopefully Collective Brutality can bridge the gap between the early game and the mid game for us. Uh, we will have to see. Hope we're not against something too fast. And the opponent goes Horizon Canopy, Harden Scales, Mox Opal. Well, that's something very fast. We draw Maelstrom Pulse. Good card in the matchup, but not exactly speeding us up at all. So we've just got to play a Blooming Marsh and pass back. Uh, double Canopy, they've got some pain coming from their lands here, but, you know. They uh, tap out for a Hanger Backwalker. 2-2 two -two Hanger Backwalker. Uh, it's, it's nice value, and I think we just have to kill it before it gets any bigger. Fatal Push is a good draw, but we will use the Collective Brutality here. It's just, a, it's just mana efficient. And I don't think Draining for 2 is, is very good here. What are we going to pitch? Maybe Tireless Tracker? I don't know. You know, he could drain them for two, but uh, usually Hardened Scales doesn't eke out a victory against you, right? Like, e either you usually keep them under reps, or they overwhelm you. It's usually not a, a match where the two life uh, gained is all that relevant. Okay, they have a Forest into Arcbound Ravager, and they have another Arcbound Ravager. Well, this is just miserable for us, my friends. They've got they had the turn one scales, they're on the play, and they've got all kinds of gas. All kinds of gas, is specifically Ravager, is a really hard one for us to beat. We draw Liliana of the Veil, that is poor. That is poor, we just basically wanted more cheap spot removal. So what can we do here? We can Fatal Push a Ravager, and then we can Bluff and try to buy a turn and hope they don't go all in. Or... We can play a Liliana of the Veil and tick down and be mana efficient, and then they're kind of dead on board. Or we can try to Maelstrom Pulse something. Now, here's one of many, many reasons Arc Bounder Ravager is a big thorn in our side. At instant speed, they can sacrifice an artifact. So we're not two for one in anything with the Maelstrom Pulse here if they're awake. So I sat here and I thought about it for a while, and I was like, you know what? I really don't think I can beat this board no matter what I do. My, basically, my best hope is to try to Maelstrom Pulse the Ravagers and hope the opponent f 6 So, <laughs> we're hoping the opponent's asleep at the wheel. We're going for the Pulse. And, of course, they're not. Because, you know, maybe they're 4-0 as well, playing for the 5-0. And they just get all the value in the world. They eat some stuff with the Ravager. They put it on the other Ravager. And now we're tapped out. And now they find an Arcbound Worker off the top, and they have yet another Arcbound Ravager. This is a certified nut draw, and they just get to absolutely go all in. I guess playing around Slaughter Pact here, they divide their counters uh, pretty expertly here, hitting us for exactly lethal across a couple different attackers, including one they can shift counters to with their Ravager if they need be. Um, and, and we are just dead. We are just very, very dead. Uh, they turned for us through two removal spells. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do about that? Nothing we could have done differently there, in my opinion. Again, maybe Fatal Push and Bluff, but well, after they drew that uh, that second Ravager and the they had an Arcbound Worker in hand, there's just no chance we're going to beat that on the draw here with this hand. Uh, if we were on the play, things might have been a little bit different. Might have been a little bit different if we could have gone... Um, well, then again, they didn't expose a turn one creature, right? So who knows? Um, but, you know, possibly tapping out for Kalidas on turn four, having spent some removal earlier to keep the board somewhat clear, even if it was a little suboptimal. Tap out for Kalidas, maybe live and take it from there. But yeah, on the draw, we just got wrecked by Hard and Scales Affinity. So um, tough start, but let's take a look at the sideboard, see what to do against this deck. Okay, so against Scales Affinity, Modular Affinity, Green Robots, whatever you want to call them, uh, we've got a lot to do that's pretty good. Uh, Damnation is in for sure. Maelstrom Pulse, as always, our good friend the Pulse, pretty much always comes in, no exception here. EE is a very high-ceiling card here. Um, as is Liliana the Last Hope, 
There, she's a little bit worse here sometimes than she is against Affinity, but we certainly still want to. She can certainly still really cripple them if you get her going in the right window. Um, other cards that are kind of in the second tier, I would say, of, uh, of power would be Collective Brutality. Again, like I said, the life is not that relevant. Um, the discard mode, not that relevant, but anything that can potentially kill a problem permanent before it gets out of control... Like we did see in game one, it, it took care of a of a hanger back walker. I think it, it should at least be considered. Uh, same for Fulminator Mage, you know, just hitting the man lands basically with Fulminator Mage, totally reasonable. So what do we not like here? Well, there is a good amount that we don't like, and we have brought in at least four, maybe another four. Um, thought Seize is bad, they empty their hand too quickly, they pressure our life total too well. We take out the Thought Seizes, leaving the Inquisitions. Uh, Liliana, the Veil, also pretty bad. I think we cut two always, for sure. And then, on the play, you can consider leaving in a second one, or you can, uh, you can just say we're gonna cut three and leave in exactly one. Honestly, depending on your configuration, cutting all four is totally reasonable, too. She's really not very good. But... Uh, tireless Tracker is also quite slow, um, so we are probably cutting one Lily and one Tracker for sure every game from that position, so, or excuse me, no, we, we already cut our two Lilies, so we, we're probably cutting one Tracker no matter what. Let's just say if we bring in all of these and we're on the play, maybe we could cut all Trackers and leave in two Lilies of the Veil, but I think I'd rather play a more balanced split like this. And maybe, you know what, I think I actually did here um, is only brought in two Fulminator Mages. We just kind of hedged a little bit. Like, Fulminator Mage is not a, a back-breaking card necessarily against them. It's fine. But I think we just said, all right, exactly one Liliana. We're probably not going to leverage anything more than that. And, uh, you know, a couple Tireless Tracker, again, very slow. Is the second tracker better than the third Fulminator Mage? I don't know. It's kind of a toss-up to me. So that's a that's a bit um, questionable, a, a bit borderline. But you could go either way with that. Totally fine. But I believe my configuration was exactly this. And uh, let's go to the next game, see what happened. All right, my friends. Trying to claw back here and in, into this match five against Hardened Scales and... Once again, we have a hand that's kind of light on gas. We're seeing a lot of these four landers here, but you know what? In my opinion, this hand is a snap keep. We have one of our best cards in the form of Fatal Push. We have Field of Ruin, which is very effective interaction. We have Bob, who is very, very good on the play, can catch us up, get us more gas. And Kalidus is one of our best cards, again, specifically on the play. Very, very nice in the matchup. So even though the hand has kind of some gaps in it, I think it it should really it, um, it should really be a keep. I went ahead and ran out the marsh flats because I don't necessarily expect them to play a turn one creature. If they do, I can just fetch swamp and push it. If not, I can fetch an overgrown tomb and save my life total a little bit. Uh, turn one hardened scales. Well, both games they've kept seven with a turn one hardened scales. That's pretty rough. And welding jar and mox opal. Okay, okay, you got it. So. As promised, we'll get the tomb, and we draw a trophy. Okay, so this is a super interesting spot. I thought about the Bob, I thought about the main phase trophy, and in the end I just said, I'm going to pass to you. I'm going to hope you kind of tap out for like a, I don't know what, something that, some creature basically. We want them to tap out for a creature. We'll hit the scales in response. They're going to go with an animation module, and they're going to go with an ancient stirring. So... Uh, everything is lining up kind of not our way. They find a Lanoir Reborn. It's a nice uh, nice little graft land. They're going to play it. Sure. All right. So they go ahead, and that's all they're doing. So no creature yet. We still just trophy the scales away for sure. We've got to use our mana efficiently. That's a card we need to answer anyway, right? But ramping them, not the most ideal. And we draw Tireless Tracker. Not a very good draw. Um, not one of our better cards in the matchup. And again, it's kind of competing for that turn four play with, with Kalidus. 
and Kalidas is just better, so we really wanted this to be interaction. We wanted Tracker to be like Inquisition here would be perfect, or, you know, just Abrupt Decay, Trophy, Pulse, Push, anything. Um, but now we at least we get to hold up Fatal Push, right? The opponent's got a dismember for the Confidant. Yikes. Major yikes here. Uh, we really kind of wanted that Bob to stick around, to say the least. The good news is they play a land. They've only got two cards left in hand. One is a Steel Overseer. Okay. And the other is... Hanger Backwalker. All right, you know, these are these are some tough cards. These are some tough customers to handle, but looks potentially beatable. They are totally empty-handed. They do get to make a servo. This is all very good. They get to uh, put their counter from Lanoir Reborn onto the walker. It's all very nice. Um, so here I will go ahead and, and choose to just be mono-efficient. We're going to try to push the Overseer, um, and they... Sack the Welding Jar to protect it as expected. Now, this is horrible, my friends. We draw yet another Tireless Tracker. Like I just showed you, we only left two in. We already have all, you know, the the threat we really need, which is Kalidus. We really just wanted to, like, have those be, like, any combination of Push, Decay, Pulse, Trophy, anything like that. Even Planeswalkers here are fine, but the opponent... Found a little bit of gas off the top. Doesn't look like the scariest, and to be fair, it's not. But uh, really, we wanted to fade a, dr a draw step here. We wanted them to not have a creature, because any creature lets them just go wild. They make a bunch of servos, they anthem the whole team of Steel Overseer, and they pass. And we draw yet another threat. Ooh, not good. Not good at all. So I almost played the Scoos here, and then I actually looked at the graveyards and was like, there's... Literally only one creature to eat. I guess Tireless Tracker is a better play here because we're not putting anything into the yard from here on out if our Kalidas sticks around. If our Kalidas doesn't stick around, we're just dead. So I might as well be more mana efficient, play the three drop. Uh, it's potentially better if I top deck a land anyway, right? So end step, they get to make the walker bigger. Very, very tough position we're in right now, my friends. And... Looks like they found some action, but they're not exactly sure how to tap for it. What's it going to be? Well, it's a walking ballista off the top, so yep. Here come all the, uh, here come the servos. Here come all the, uh, anthem effects, the permanent counters, more servos. It's very, very bad for us. And now they get to make a very, uh, a very bold attack and we actually have to be very careful with how we, how we block here because they have the Ballista to finish our stuff off. So even if we block a 2-2 with Kalidus, the Ballista will almost certainly just ping the Kalidus down. And so right now we are taking 5 plus 10 over here, 2 three threes and 2 two twos is 10. We're taking 15 damage if we do not block. The opponent has a 2-2 walking Ballista. That means we're not actually dead. We can take the 15, we can get pinged down to 1, and then we're not dead. So we could consider trading with a tireless tracker. I don't know where that gets us. I don't think that gets us anywhere. I might as well not, because I'm basically either going to draw Damnation this turn, or I'm going to die. So do the math. I, I triple-checked it just to make sure I'm not just literally dead here. And indeed I'm not. I go to 3. They can only ping me for 2, so they just pass. Damnation... Or die. And it's an Inquisition of Kozilek. So our draws in this match were just miserable, my friends. They were just miserable. We got our clunky threats that aren't any good. If we're not already even or ahead, we drew our Inquisition, which we really needed earlier in the game. We had a great window for it on turn three when we played Bob. Didn't happen. Uh, and, and we just lacked the interaction, right? We, we basically had no choice but to trophy that scales, and it didn't matter because they just absolutely outground us. They out-top decked us. They out-top decked us, which sucks, but they had a really explosive start. They kept seven. Uh, they were accelerating past us. They were the aggressor, and they, they also outdrew us. So 
Nothing we could really have done here. I think that hand was a keep. You can see how that could have gone really, really well for us. It wasn't the opening hand that was the issue. Fatal Push, Field of Ruin, um, Kalidus, these cards are all amazing. These cards are all amazing in the matchup. It was our top decks that let us down. And unfortunately, we just kind of got nutted on. We just kind of got run over here by Hard and Scales Affinity, um, putting us... Back, uh, back to reality. No 5-0 and for us today, my friends. However, what a fun league. What a successful league, by the way. 4-1, and I will take all day, every day. That is awesome, if you ask me. And we had a really, really intense game one against Mono Red Prison, where the combat steps were huge on both sides, very close for multiple turns. And uh, we got there, then game two, we just kind of curved out on them and, and showed them the business. Some really tricky combat steps and, and decisions overall as well over three grindy matchups against Bant Eldrazi. And, uh, you know, despite perhaps not respecting enough the power of Eldrazi Displacer in Game 1, we still got there at the end of the, at the, end of the match. Um, then we took down the mirror. Feels good after our previous league. We lost to some, some very, very bad flood in the mirror match here. We redeemed ourselves. We came back strong. We won the mirror match 2-1, to one, winning both post-sideboard games. And then in round four, well, we just kind of, uh, we just kind of got there against, uh, against Shadow. We had some patches where it looked a little bit sketchy with our flood in, in game one and then with the double angler bearing down on us in game two. But we were able to reverse the tides and we came out with a very clean 2 nothing win over Shadow. Only for it to all come crashing down to earth here in round 5, getting absolutely destroyed by Hard and Scales Affinity. I don't think the matchup is as bad as it looked here, that's for sure. I don't think it's a good matchup, but I don't think the matchup is as bad as it seemed. We just we were just too clunky, a little bit too slow. Um and we, we just kind of got out top deck. The opponent played very well, so so cr full credit where credit is due. The opponent piloted this excellently and uh, and made no mistakes, took us down. So um, anyway, it's a great league. It's a great league. Lots of really interesting gameplay here, lots of interaction, and our deck really spreading its wings and doing some good work in the meta, finishing up 4-1, and one, getting us... We cashed the league and then some. You know, that always feels good as well, so... As always, my friends, I thank you so much for watching, and I thank you so much for supporting this content. Remember, we if you can push me over that edge up, uh, up above 100 bucks per month at Patreon, we're only, what, $7 away? $7 per month away. That's very easy to do. And uh, you get the tier rewards for supporting this, this content. You get access to the scouting reports. You get to vote on the next scouting reports, and then more. Um, beyond that... Once we're at that mark, I'll start doing some uh, some leagues for my patrons with the lists that they send me, the BG lists, BGX lists they send me anyway. We'll have to see if we expand into Jundar abs, and that might be a little pricey uh, for me to invest into, but maybe not. Maybe it's doable. I'll have to run the numbers. But regardless, you know, um, hopefully most of my patrons want to play just different variations of Golgari, which would be sweet, different configurations. Maybe a different sub-theme, maybe something a little bit off the wall, or maybe a very competitive and tuned list that just happens to be a bit different from mine. All of that stuff is available to, uh, will be available to my patrons. Um, we'll figure out the exact numbers for that. It's basically going to be a system where the amount you're donating works you toward a total. Like the total you've donated o over your, your lifetime, and then once you, you hit that certain total, whether it be $40, $50, whatever... Um, you, you're eligible for me to play a league with your list for free. Um, so it's, it's just kind of another reward and not asking anything extra to do this. It's just kind of incentivizing people, hey, to, to throw a couple bucks my way if you can afford to, to trade value for value, just like interactive uh, players should, and to support this content. So uh, remember to check that out if you're interested. Remember also to smash that subscribe button, my friends, if you're not subscribed, that's another great way to help my channel grow, and that in turn helps me bring you more content. So uh, remember to let me know what you think about these games and the sideboarding and, and the lines and all that good stuff. Remember to like, remember to comment, and to share, and thank you to all of my patrons currently supporting me, and thanks to everybody else who watches this. 
I, uh, I look forward to hearing your feedback. And it's unfortunate we the 5-0 slipped out of our grasp here, but we were very, very close. Hopefully we can get it next time. So thanks again for watching. I will talk to you soon. Hope you have a great night.